Being recorded now. <laughs> All right. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to uh, uh, 2017 UA CAC Controlled Environment Agriculture Center Summer Research Retreat. Um, you're trying to find your place, uh, and we have a very exciting, uh, very informal uh, uh, discussion session this morning for you. Um, and on a kind of tight schedule as well, we have about 20 some speakers uh, today uh, who are going to share with you some of our, uh, some of their uh, activities and uh, accomplishments. So uh, this research retreat actually started as a very informal uh, get-together uh, social event back in 2008 or 9, uh, uh, 8, uh, for us here as a faculty, staff, and students to get together again, talk about our research activities, and inform each other um, in, in more uh, depth. Um, then later on, this became an annual uh, activity, a tradition. And it grew. Uh, we were not webcasting. Right now, we're webcasting. We have our uh, uh, guests joining us, uh, and um, we are and we are very happy about that. So I would like to welcome again and thank you um, for joining us, including uh, so among us today we have our associate Parker Entin uh, for CALS, CALS of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Uh, my department head, Dr. Kit Farrell Poe, is with us, and also we have uh, some of our uh, advisory board members joining us for the first time. We are going to have our inaugural advisory board meeting for CAC this afternoon by invitation. So some of them are with us uh, in the audience here. I believe Chris Higgins is here. Uh, he is the CEO of uh, Hort Americas. And uh, we have Dan McDonald, director of Pima County Cooperative Extension. Uh, Peter Condon, he is the program director of the Sustainable Agriculture Applied Science and Technology Program at the Mesa Community College. And we have David Story, one of our alumni management system consultant from Reader Hordemax, uh, joining us here in the room. And we also have uh, some of our board members joining uh, through uh, a go to meeting. Jen Freimark, uh, she is the chief greenhouse operator from Gotham Greens in New York. Paul Hardy, CEO of uh, Civic Farms, a word of company, and um, those and 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 uh, we also have uh, Brian uh, Embelang, the CEO of Future Swiss Greenhouse here in and also uh, I would like to thank you our faculty uh, staff who start the research activity in in my lab um, and, and just talk about what we have been up to and what's coming up so uh, this is uh, our lab uh, as of today uh, we have uh, Paige yeah, uh, Jeff Postdoctoral researcher uh, Ying Zhang. She is a PhD uh, student. 
Uh, Alex Feldman is a professional science master's student through the uh, GIDP program. Ken Saku Okada, a math student, and uh, Brian Kaplan, he is a master's student. And we recently also uh, welcomed uh, Anna uh, Rios, a uh, visiting scholar from uh, National University of Columbia. Um, some of our ongoing research uh, activities, uh, one of them is regional agal fistock te test bed. This project was funded by DOE uh, uh, for the past uh, three, uh, four years uh, 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 as of today, and we'll be actually uh, concluding this project. And our focus has been to establish multi-state diverse capabilities to evaluate um, algae uh, production, um, obtaining uh, long-term algae cultivation data in various uh, systems, using various systems and technologies and also collecting standardized data sets using models to evaluate uh, long-term algae cultivation and also scenarios. Um, our lab's contribution has been mostly on uh, the control, monitoring, automation of the algae uh, raceway uh, and photobioreactor-based uh, 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 production uh, systems. And Jeff Gia has been working on that project, and he's going to give you some of the details about our activity there. Um, this is our second phase USDA SBIR project, recognizing the need and challenges in the vertical farming uh, for urban agriculture settings. Uh, we have a collaborative project here, uh, working with uh, uh, Young Sun from SIE department and with our sponsor, uh, Grafted Growers, targeting transplant uh, tomato seedling production in vertical farming systems. And we are addressing the challenges for the design, the, the most, uh, the best or optimized designs for the vertical farm operations is a simulation-based logistics analysis to determine what would be the best design to operate in vertical farm systems. And based on that uh, result, uh, output coming from Dr. Sound's lab, then we take those data and suggested design parameters to design a, a, a better or most appropriate air distribution systems to deliver conditioned air for the plant production zones, ultimately uh, leading to optimized resource use. And we use computer simulations. And Ying Zhang is working on that uh, project. And she's going to talk about uh, our project activities there. Uh, we recently got funding from uh, Bionation Agriculture Research and Development Funding, collaborating with Volkani Research Center and Triangle Research Center uh, in Israel. And our focus in this project is on integration of uh, uh, power generating systems using solar energy uh, to greenhouse systems and looking into the uh, capabilities of this agrivoltaic uh, uh, integration for greenhouse crop production. Organic photovoltaics is, a, is an advancing technology in photovoltaics area, uh, but the research lacks in terms of the limitations and advantages of this technology. So uh, we will be working with this uh, project uh, for the next uh, three years. And Kensaka Okada works in that project, and he's going to talk about some of our activities up to date. Again, recognizing the, the growth and the interest in vertical farm uh, applications using artificial lighting uh, for crop production, for urban agriculture, and also recognizing some of the challenges that the industry is having in terms of the amount of resources used, mainly for electrical energy, for air conditioning, and air distribution, non-uniformity in the uh, systems, and many, many others. We, uh, recognizing this need, we uh, uh, secured uh, funding from Water, Environmental, and Energy Solutions Program here at the UFA with support also coming from our resources here at the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center. Collaborating with our industrial partners, we launched this program on urban agriculture, vertical farm uh, systems program to enhance our capabilities for research, teaching, and outreach, uh, to work with the industry uh, through partnerships for research technology developments and providing education and internship opportunities for students 
and also educating our uh, stakeholders and the public in terms of urban agriculture systems. Uh, one of the need in this type of systems is automation and monitoring and control applications and decision support systems to enable the operator to have access to key information, the variables, climatic variables, so informed decisions or uh, management practices can be established. So uh, Alex Feldman in our lab designed and implemented this uh, uh, data visualization analytics and decision support system to provide such information coming in real time from the vertical farm system and through some data mining uh, uh, to provide resource use information also for the operator to optimize the um, operations in the system. Uh, we're kind of uh, moving into integration of more artificial intelligence, and maybe machine learning, using some of the climatic data, crop-related data. So uh, in the near future, we would like to see the crop actually uh, controlling some of the uh, processes in these type of settings. And in that regard, we already started working on implementing or trying to kind of design a biofeedback-based LED lighting uh, grant through NSF, National Science Foundation, providing unique on-site training opportunities uh, for masters and PhD students. Total of 26 students will be uh, trained through this program. And the project basically bridges natural, social, and physical sciences, including engineering, uh, to develop novel and sustainable solutions for off-the-grid uh, safe drinking water, brine management operations, and control them on agriculture systems. We are also collaborating with Diné College and Navajo Nation University for curriculum and teaching and training development, as well as our collaborators from different institutions, as you can see here. I'm scheduled to attend a symposium in, uh, in China in two weeks. Uh, this is the Greenhouse Technology Plant Factory uh, Symposium. Uh, brings about 350 uh, experts and scientists, researchers, uh, uh, industry participants from around the world. And we are invited to give presentations. And some of our lab members are also making presentations. I like to invite and encourage those of you who might be interested in horticultural applications. This is a uh, horticultural congress. 30th horticultural congress will be organized in Istanbul, Turkey in August 2018. And I am heavily involved in the organization uh, of these two symposiums, Innovation, New Technology, and Protective Cultivation and mechanization, precision, horticulture, and robotics applications. We also uh, we will be organizing a workshop on phenotyping for horticultural uh, crops. I think this is basically a summary of our activities. And I'd like to thank and acknowledge our sponsors and everyone involved uh, uh, in these research activities. Thank you. All right. I believe our next presenter is Jeff. And after several presentations, I believe we have 10 minutes Q&A, and later on, we have a coffee break to receive the questions. <coughs> Some of the questions. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeff Fei Jia, but you can call me Jeff. I'm going to talk about the research I've been doing for the past four years in this uh, RAFT project. So um, as we all know, uh, that it's really important and it's necessary to monitor and control any growing system or biological system in the control environment uh, uh, agriculture. And in this case, I've been working on microalgae monitoring and control. Uh, macroalgae, you can consider it as a tiny plant. So in either outdoor or indoor growing uh, systems, we have to monitor environmental factors, such as temperature, sunlight, uh, dissolved oxygen, electrical conductivity. But there's also a need to monitor uh, uh, the, bio, uh, the biomass or the microalgae itself. Uh, traditionally, it's done by uh, taking samples manually and send it to a lab uh, or uh, on-site lab to, me uh, to measure the ash-free dry weight or the optical density of microalgae. But there's no such sensors that can uh, measure microalgae growth in real time. So for the first 
two years of the project, I developed this um, optical sensor to monitor microalgae concentration in real time. Uh, and also, we uh, applied uh, a U.S. Uh, I think international patent on this uh, application. So another problem with uh, microalgae growing system is that uh, the crashing problem. Uh, that is the total failure of the uh, microalgae growing system, and it happens really uh, rapidly. And uh, if you don't know it's going to happen, uh, it doesn't give you much time to react on the situation. So along with the uh, optical density sensor, uh, with a, a, the real-time monitoring capability, I developed a, a, an algorithm to uh, predict and uh, foresee the crashing of the microalgae. Uh, so here's an overview of the algorithm. Uh, you don't have to read into this, this uh, uh, graph. So it's a, uh, it's a simulation graph showing you how uh, the raw data was processed through uh, this whole process and then gives uh, the final user some uh, uh, useful information. So the centerpiece of this algorithm is artificial neural network. So that's a, a, a way of machine learning. So you don't have to know exactly what happened in the system as long as you tell the system what the condition is and what the outcome is so you can train the machine to solve the problem for you. So uh, basically it's mimicking how uh, the neural um, new, uh, uh, neural systems in uh, animals or human works. So you have the inputs. In this case, we have temperature, uh, photosynthetic active, active radiation, and the growth rate of microalgae systems. And you train the system. You tell uh, the neural network what's the outcome is going to be. Is there going to be a, a growth? Is how how fast it's going to grow? Uh, grow, and then uh, 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 the neural network. Uh, forms to work for your similar problems. So on the right side is a uh, uh, calibration between uh, the model predicted growth rate versus the measured growth rate from the optical, uh, optical density sensor. As you can see, there's a very tight correlation between the two. So uh, the artificial neural network uh, did a good job predicting uh, the growth rate of microalgae. So here's uh, uh, some results from uh, a real-time simula simulation. So the data is from a uh, real uh, uh, is measured from a microalgae growth system. So it's a real data. So the red line you're seeing is uh, the predicted growth rate from uh, the neural network, and the blue line is showing uh, the real-time measurement of the growth rate. So it, as you can see, the first part of the data was used for tr uh, a neural network training because it's considered as healthy data. And then the late, in the later part, as you can see, there's discrepancy, discrepancy developed be, between the predicted and the measured uh, growth rate. That's when you know there's something going um, wrong with the system. As you can see, the crash of uh, the microalgae growing system happened at that point, but the system was able to detect the discrepancy between the two uh, way earlier. Right. So going back to the whole algorithm, uh, uh, not only used the uh, uh, artificial neural network, but I incorporated two other parameters to further strengthen uh, the accuracy of the system. So the workflow is like this. So uh, I used the temperature and the PAR, also the real-time growth rate, to feed into the neural network. So I can predict uh, the growth rate of uh, the microalgae growing system under certain uh, environmental conditions. And then compare the two, uh, compare the predicted and measured, I can get an error, prediction error from the system. And then using the real-time growth rate also dissolve oxygen, they are good indicators of uh, microalgae growth. So uh, using those two parameters uh, um, uh, combined with the prediction error, uh, I set up some rules to compare it to a threshold value. So if one of them is greater than threshold value or two or three, you give different levels of warnings. And then finally, it generates some warnings or indicators for the final user to make their decision on. Or you can uh, make an um, uh, automated warning system for the users. 
So here is some uh, simulation results from the host system. So as you can see, uh, the blue line on top is the real-time optical density of the growing system, and the red line is the number of flags or warnings sent out by the system. So as uh, as the uh, uh, microalgae cultural progress, uh, you can see there is some one or two peaks uh, in the earlier stage of the uh, uh, of the system, but as it doesn't raise much concern because the only one parameter in case there's some problem. But during the later uh, phase of the culture, you can see there are two or three uh, warnings or flags were raised by the system. That uh, brings much more concern to the operators. So it probably uh, suggests the users to look into the system and see if there's any uh, uh, abnormalities going on. And uh, the, the line on the bottom is showing the prediction error. So as the prediction error gro goes down, you, you, uh, you will know there's some problem with it. And then with this algorithm, uh, so the green arrow is indicating where the crash was uh, detected by the neural network. And uh, the yellow one is indicating the crash that's indicated by the OD sensor. And the red arrow is indicating uh, the crash that, that was uh, visually observed by operators. And there is a 24 hours gap between the two. So, so uh, that buys you valuable time to rescue the culture or do uh, whatever remedy you can apply to the culture to uh, minimize your loss. Um, and there are some activities I've, uh, I've done uh, during the summer. I went to this uh, uh, ABBB. Uh, a meeting, uh, a conference in Miami to present my recent work there and enjoy some warm sea uh, water. That's really, all right, and that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Good morning, Aminda. Um, okay. Good morning. Today I'm going to present some results. Uh, Yeah, hold it up. Okay, okay, me. Sure. Okay, thank you. And um, today I'm going to present some results for my dissertation project, uh, enhancing enhancing climate uniformity for optimized resource use in indoor plant factory. And in indoor indoor plant factory, especially for commercial um, systems, uh, has been mostly uh, constructed in warehouse buildings with multi-tier um, production shelves and the artificial lightings. A non-uniform uh, non air climate may be um, observed in, in each um, production shelf because of the limited and, and uneven air circulation in, in the indoor plant factory. As you can see in the image here, um, um, different fans and air tubes were um, applied to trying to improve the climate uniformity in indoor plant factory. There are many different designs of there are many different designs of air distribution systems and in indoor plant factory. It's very important to look into the internal ventilation airflow in indoor plant factory to um, effectively deliver the air condi conditioned air into the shelf to achieve desired envir environment for crops 
um, potentially improve the resource use efficiency. The technology of computational fluid dynamics has been widely used in um, control environment agriculture to analyze the climate inside of the production system, especially for greenhouse application. And there are a few um, CFD studies uh, can be um, found for um, studying the airflow in indoor plant factory. So in my study, I um, applied the, the, the CFD technology to analyze and evaluate um, the different designs of air distribution system for a warehouse-based um, indoor plant factory. Um, with stem mass for rate and the stem supply air temperature for further comparison of air velocity and temperature for different designs. Here shows uh, five cases uh, with case zero as a, uh, um, case zero is assumed to be a control with um, supply air, um, uh, supply and the return air vents close to the ceiling. And the case one and two has the same position for the inlet vents and the two different um, position for the outlets on the ceiling or on the bottom of the sidewall. Uh, case three and case four had um, used the perforated air tube to provide uh, air flow into the system and to provide an um, um, supply supply air into the system and uh, with um, return vents on the ceiling. Here shows the case comparison of climate uniformity for five cases. And 10,000 data um, at each different height of the plan were, um, was, was studied for each cases, um, 10 centimeter and 20 centimeter. And the relative um, standard deviation represents the uniformity of the um, climate for air temperature, or air, air velocity and air temperature. Com compared to the control case, case zero, we can see case one, two, case, case one, case two, and case three cannot improve the uniformity of air velocity in the production shelf. Therefore, um, we only look at case zero and case four in today's presentation. Here shows the case zero. We have three plants um, across the length along the length of the shelf, um, one close to the inlet, three close to the outlet. And uh, here shows the air velocity and temperature distribution as three plants. And we can see how air flow affects the temperature distribution in the system. For example, we can see how it accumulates in the middle and upper of the shelves. And we also can observe some stagnant zone for air flow um, at some, some positions. Here shows the case four. Um, we have perforated air tubes um, supply air horizontally to each shelf. Uh, you can see the airflow pattern here. Um, there are two plants. One, one plant is between the air jets, and two is just at the air jets. So you can see how air jets affect the airflow distribution uh, in the shelf, especially where uh, where has um, where yeah, especially for the, um, we can, especially the position um, location with air jets. And um, here shows the climate uniformity for air temperature. We can see a uniform air temperature can be achieved at both of the plants. A further comparison for case zero and case four um, for air velocity and temperature is um, shown and here shows the air velocity. Um, we assume um, from the previous um, slides, we can see how the position of the air tube can affect the air velocity and the uniformity. Uh, we have five different plant height here, and you can see below, um, below the height of 20%, we can achieve the desired air velocity, which, which is between 0 0.3 to 1 meter per second, but above 20 centimeter, we can see a non, uh, increase on a lower uniformity of air velocity for case four, and, but higher air velocity. Uh, it shows um, and the position of the air jets significantly affects the air velocity and the uniformity of airflow in the production shelf. 
So for these two charts shows the how and temperature distribution at deep five different heights. In case case four has a higher average air temperature in compared to the control case, but it achieved a higher air uniformity, uh, air temperature uniformity. And b this is because the air jets can well mix the heat released from the lamp and uh, achieve a more uniform air temperature, but a higher temperature in the whole system. So uh, according to this result, um, the case four can be as a alternative design for indoor plant factory application, but a further study for the position and the configuration of the air tube and, and the air shelf is required for further analysis. Uh, I'm still working on a, another um, cases which has a air tube per placing in the shelf um, supply um, vertical airflow into the crop canopy. I cannot show the results right now, but I hope I can publish it later. Thank you. Let's jump up. We're going to start some Q&A with uh, the Kachira Advanced Sensing and Climate Control Collab real quick. We'll have Kinsaku Okada um, come up in just a moment, but let you get some questions out of the way and we'll get together. About the presentation so far, let's uh, have some questions uh, until the next speaker is ready. Rafi? I have a, oh, right here. I have a question about the algae system. Uh, you measured growth using optical density. My question is, how do you differentiate the optical density that uh, happens due to algae cell division as opposed to a contaminant? like uh, bacterium or fungus. It seems to me that in real life, the two have to be distinguished on the basis possibly of wavelength rather than just optical density. Right. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I use two different wavelengths on my sensor to measure the optical density. So one is at uh, 680 nanometer. That's normally used for green algae. So. Uh, it detects how much green is absorbed absorbed by the algae, and the other one is uh, near infrared, so you can measure total turbidity of the suspension. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. My question is is more about uh, recalibrating the optical density sensor for use in compost and vermites uh, to sense archaea, bacteria, ciliates, flagellates, and, and the rest of the microbial life. Is that possible? I think so. We haven't tried ciliates or uh, bacteria, but we did a run with uh, yeast fermentation, and it did uh, show really good uh, correlation with uh, ash free dry weight of uh, yeast. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting, uh, but anyway, uh, let me start. So my presentation. Ah, oh, I have to introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Ken Sokokada. I'm a student at ABE and working on a project at Dr. Cassius Lab. So in my presentation, I'd I'd like to introduce uh, the project. 
So the project is about agrivoltaics, uh, which is a type of farming where you grow plants and gen generate electricity at the same land. So concretely, you know, as you can see from the slides, uh, you put the PV modules on the roofs and you, you're going you're gonna to grow plants beneath them. And uh, there are two main advantages of agrivoltaics. First, uh, you can avoid the land, you know, the land demand conflation between the demand for uh, farming and electric generation in ways solar energy. And the second is uh, you can make use of a kind of a surplus uh, solar energy of farming for power generation. So this advantage is quite effective, especially in arid and semi-arid areas uh, like here Tucson, because you know, as most of you know, you know there is often too strong a sun for farming here. And in the project, we're going to use uh, organic PV modules, or in other words, OPB. And the difference of OPB, you know, as a material from, you know, just a gen, you know, general conventional ones is quite simple. OPB is, you know, just, you know, at, just as the, you know, the name shows, it's made from organic substances, uh, but uh, the general ones are from, you know, convention, you know, conventional ones are from inorganic materials like silicon. And so the difference as a material is quite simple, but the characteristics is quite different. Uh, first, you know, uh, as these pictures shows, you know, it is flexible and semi-transparent, and uh, uh, you can change the color and and design as you like. Uh, in other words, you can tune the you know light intensity absorbed by the OPB film. And the third uh, advantage is of advantage of OPB film is uh, you can decrease the cost uh, by using the conventional printing and uh, printing equipments and techniques, you know, like this, making, you know, making this as a kind of a role. And yes, so these are the advantages, but, you know, there are of course some uh, disadvantages. There are mainly two. So first is the sale efficiency of OPV is still quite smaller than the conventional ones. And, and the second is, oh, where is it? Yes, okay. Uh, so what is six? Sorry, but uh, oh, sorry. So about that. Yeah, it's working. Where is six? Oh, sorry. Okay. So the second is the life. Ah, uh, the lifespan. I mean the the kind of a term. You know, you can use OPV films with a kind of stable function is still unsure. So overall, we don't know much about the functionality of this new material, especially under real environments. So that's why we're gonna, uh, we're gonna research about it. So uh, as Dr. Castillo mentioned a little, uh, we haven't started the experiment itself. We just, we're just gonna start it. So right now I'm focusing on the first objective, which is about modeling. So I'm de developing, a, developing a model simulating uh, electricity generation and plant yield uh, by Python. I'm going to tell you a detail about it later. So uh, this is a picture of the greenhouses, as most of you have seen. Uh, these, these are at SIAC. And these are the cases of the simulation I made. Uh, okay, so I assume that during the cultivation period from January 1st and May 31st, and um, during this period, uh, I assume that the roof of the greenhouse is covered by 25%, 25% of the roof is covered by OPB, OPB module, uh, but I changed the condition of the OPB module and the, the inside the greenhouse during the summer period. So for example, in case one, I assume that the roof of the greenhouse is completely covered by the OPD film, and as a result, the you know the light inside is is, is going to be quite dark. And on the other hand, in case three, you know, I assume that the, you're going to grow the plants for the whole season, and you're going to see you know what's the difference of the yield is going to be like. Okay, so uh, this is just a kind of an image of the uh, model I programmed. I input a lot of information to the program, like uh, greenhouse specification and weather data 
and a lot of equations calculating the light intensity in the greenhouse and plant yield and the, and the electricity, electricity yield. I'm still you know, refining it, but the current code generates uh, generates crop yield and uh, uh, yeah, crop yield and electricity yield for a given period. Okay, so this is the one of the main results, the simulation exhibits. Uh, it shows the plant fresh weight per head uh, for the whole one year simulation period. So for example, uh, so paying attention to this cycle, it shows this period starting from the January 1st for 35 days, and we're gonna harvest the, pl the plant on this point. And the average plant fresh weight per head where our, uh, is around 150 grams. And kind of an unacceptably you know, too large fresh weight was observed with case two, uh, where we are, we assume that the OB because ratio during the summer period is 50%. So the reason why it happens is that the average DLI during this cultivation cycle was was too high, extremely high. So I'm improving, this, improving the program so that we can, I can penalize correctly uh, the final fresh weight uh, by and by thinking about the too, ex, too strong sunlight. Okay. Uh, this is the second result, so which shows the total fresh total plant fresh weight per area, and the electricity yield per greenhouse fuller, fuller area, with with of the module coverage ratio in the cultivation period during the whole whole simulation period. So the way to interpret this graph is, for example, if you want to compare the plant yield of case one and case two uh, of the of the plant yield, you're going to just compare these numbers around 45 kilograms per square meter and around 60. And at the same time, you can see uh, you can see the you can see the total energy production for the one for one year by looking at these numbers. The merit of this graph is that if you know, if you know beforehand the necessary greenhouse necessary energy to operate the greenhouse, you can estimate the necessary OPV coverage ratio, uh, which satisfies the greenhouse consumption, and the kind of expected expected yield reduction. So I'm going to present the, these results at uh, greenhouse 2017 at China uh, at this month. Okay, so that's about my presentation. Uh, last year, I'd like to acknowledge the part, uh, the organization funding this project, and these collaborators. Thank you very much. Yeah, why don't we do a we quick Q&A and then we'll... Uh, time for that. We'll uh, until next, our next speaker is ready. Uh, Peter. What was the what was the uh, percent light transmission through the OPV? Uh, around thirty. Thirty percent. Around thirty percent, right? And uh, on the greenhouse, was there a covering already on yeah, the greenhouse? Yeah, I assume that the covering was uh, double P, and it was around eighty-seven point five percent. So, what I call it is, you know. The part of the part of the roof is covered by the you know OPB panel and you know the you know plastic film, right? So so you can you can imagine that the light intensity is decreased by these two films. Okay, thanks. Yeah. That's a very good question, and those are still the questions that everyone has. You know, what would be the most appropriate and practical and economical way of deploying these OPVs, either as a glazing itself or maybe on top of the Existing glazing. So those are the things that we hope to think about and evaluate. Pat. All right. Uh, honestly speaking, uh, I'm still researching it. I, I read, 
actually, it's it's a kind of a hot topic, and you know, a lot of chemists and but yeah, maybe chemists, you know, with, you know, is trying to increase the sale efficiency of this material with very various and very you know kind of minute or well, too complicated materials by you know adding you know different elements. So you know, yeah, I have a specification sheet, it, uh, kind of a specification document to describe the. OPD film we're going to use, uh, but sorry, currently I don't remember. But you know what I can say is, you know the best performing, you know, best performing OPD films is changing. You know the same, but you know thinking about the cost, you know, you know that top, you know the very high performance ones are very expensive. But so there are other trends that you know they are trying to decrease the cost, and you know the materials of of these OPD films is also changing. That's the current situation. Just to add to that, the, the use of organic polymers and molecules in the making of the organic photovoltaics uh, compared to a traditional silicon material used in the, a traditional photovoltaic cells, as well as how the light is excited, transported for energy conversion from light to electricity is slightly different compared to the traditional photovoltaic systems. And yeah, and they can be injected using you know specialized systems for roll-to-roll -roll production very fast. All right, another question. We can have maybe one more question. If not, our okay, next speaker ready. <laughs> All right. So collectively, we owe about thirty-five dollars for previous three speakers. So <laughs> please see the uh, the money bucket at the end of the presentations. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Stacy Galatson. Hello? Okay. Uh, I don't think, is that working okay? No. Not well. Okay, hello. Um, I'll give you a quick update on one of the organic hydroponic pieces of research that I did with my advanced crop production class last spring. Um, oh, actually, you know what, actually it wasn't the class doing it so much as they observed it, but it was um, a few students that did an independent study and internship credits. Um, what we did was we had this NFT system that the student club had built a while ago, and the student club um, allowed us to borrow it. And we split the system into two halves. So the one half had its own sump tank. The other half had a separate sump tank. And we wanted to take a look at a particular product called Terragenesis. Well, it used to be called Terragenesis. It's called Preempt now um, that, we purchased, that we had from uh, Horde Americas that they donated. Uh, and we also used a microbial inoculant with that product called Terabella. And these two, um, Horde Americas has been researching these products, and they found that these two were very well compatible and um, worked well to grow leafy vegetables. So my question with this project was not to compare the organic nutrient with inorganic, but to see how important it was to actually use a microbial inoculant with the organic nutrient product. So one half had just the organic nutrient, the other had the inoculant with it. And we grew, grew both basil and lettuce in the same crop cycle. <laughs> OK, that's not working. OK, so what we did with this product um, is we filled the sump tanks with tap water, and we allowed it to um, to sit and gas off for 24 hours. We actually aerated it with an aquarium bubbler. Uh, then we added our preempt fertilizer. And so uh, the way we were told to use the product was to check the electrical conductivity of our tap water and add one unit EC using the product. OK, so we ended up, we had a 0.3 uh, micro Siemens per centimeter on our tap water. So we added product to bring it up to 1.3. Um, and we continually aerated that. Now, at the same time, we had a separate bucket where we added 12 milliliters of Terabella with 6 milliliters of blackstrap molasses to one gallon of water. And it 
again, uh, dechlorinated water. And we let that mixture sit for 24 hours undisturbed with no aeration. And uh, once that was completed, we added to our 60-gallon sump tank um, such that uh, it would, I forget, what was the amount? Well, yeah, so we used that entire one gallon. So it was the one gallon of the inoculant mix to our 60-gallon sump tank. So we did that only with the one, that one side of the NFT system. The media that we used, we used net pots for the system, and we mixed half cocoa husk with a quarter perlite and a quarter vermiculite. Um, so something that was interesting, whether we had the inoculant in it or not, we had um, some a pH swing, in a sense. Um, when we initially mixed the uh, preempt with the tap water, the pH was about 7.3. Our tap water is around 7.8, so it brought it down a little bit. As we ran the system, this is pretty, pretty much the same whether the inoculant was in it or not. The pH went up the first week and the first two weeks to about 8.3, which is pretty um, pretty usual for a uh, microbially active nutrient solution. In my experience, the microbes like to jack that pH up. Um, but then after at week three and four, we had that pH come back down, and that usually reflects the nitrification process. So the microbes start growing and growing, and they're using the nutrition. Um, in that um, in the product, and it, then it stabilizes around six. So we did not do any pH adjustment with it, either side. So here's an example um, in the first week or two. The roots don't look so great at first. Okay, so before we put those um, before we put the seedlings in, we did allow some root zone to come out, right? So we put it in the system, and the roots get a little brownish. And it's not, it wasn't brown because of the product, although it, it does have a brown tinge to it. This was darker brown. Didn't look so great. But after three weeks, we had wonderful root zone. OK? So we had nice, wonderful white roots. And because this is NFT, we had liquid product in the bottom half of that net pot constantly flowing, and it had been aerated. But there's an air gap. Okay, so we started seeing that wonderful white root start to come out of the air gap area first. But then once it hit the nutrient, it didn't die, which I was very happy to see, but the, those nice white roots continued to grow after that initial sort of shock. Uh-oh, was that my five minutes? <laughs> okay. So here's just a quick picture at week two, uh, both sides, the one side with the inoculant, one without. Um, the one with the inoculant was slightly bigger, but, you know, hard to tell if it was appreciably bigger. At week four, both treatments were about the same size. The inoculant one looked a little bigger, but we did take some samples, and we checked our fresh weight. And what we did find was that adding the inoculant, so this was for a four-week cycle. We cut it off at four weeks, and we took fresh weights of three three. No, yeah, three plants for each. So we did find that using the inoculant increased the fresh weight by 15 to 40 percent. We had more of a difference in our lettuce than we saw in the basil, but it did, um, but it did affect it. Now, what we did find was with some of the lettuce that we let continue to grow in that system, we didn't collect um, the data afterwards, but the ones without the inoculant seemed to catch up with the other one. So what we hypothesize is that the inoculant basically jump starts the whole process. So it allows you to get that full production quicker. So we feel it's important to use the inoculant. And just uh, one last thing. Um, you can see some of the difference in the roots here. On the left, this was for basil. On the left, we had no inoculant. On the right, we had the inoculant. And there's quite a bit of a difference in the root zone. It was going to be really difficult to actually get a measurement um, on the root, so we did not do that. But visually, it was it was pretty telling. We could see with the inoculant, lots and lots of root mass. Not so much with the without the inoculant. Um, and the other big question is the cost of these types of nutrients. So we we calculated out for the nutrients and the inoculant, it came out to about twenty two cents per plant. 
That does not include the seed and does not include the media. But it was 22 cents per plant. Okay, so that was all with my uh, little organic trial. And um, instead of iron, <clears throat> my student was going to um, give this presentation about Plant Science 217, but I'm going to go ahead and do this. And this one's a quick and short presentation. Okay. Okay, so we're getting ready for the 217 course again, which is our Intro to Hydroponics and CEA. Um, so this year, just to give you an update on what we're planting in the greenhouse, um, in my teaching greenhouse, we primarily grow tomatoes. That's what I teach on. And so we have five main rows of tomatoes that I teach on that we do um, an experiment with different varieties every year. And we try to mix it up now. So we have different types of tomatoes each year and different new varieties. So this year, we're going to have two beefsteaks, two tomatoes on the vine, and one Roma tomato. And usually we only do two cherry tomatoes, but I'm going to mix it up a little more this year and do three different types. And one's going to be an orange uh, grape tomato, and the other two will be red. We're going to do two different types of mini cucumbers. We're going to have three types of eggplant. We tried eggplant last year, two different types, the purple rain type um, and the black beauty type. And this year, we're going to have those two, as well as a white eggplant. So that'll be exciting. That's going to be on the guard row. We're going to have three types of eggplant, um, and also five types of bell peppers. We're going to do red, yellow, orange. We're going to try a purple bell and a brown bell this year. So it'll be pretty exciting to see these different types of crops. Now, <laughs> we've been working hard to increase our numbers of students in 217, we've done some advertising. And last week, I had 25 students enrolled, and it went down to 22 yesterday. I don't know what happened. Um, but typically, as soon as the students get back from uh, the summer, we usually see it increase right away um, in the class. We're going to do some more advertising. Last year, we increased the enrollment to 36. We used to only be able to accommodate 28 students in that class the way we had the rows set up. Um, I changed that last year so we can accommodate 42 students in the main rows. I can go up to 50 students if I have to with the guard rows. Um, but uh, So I'm hoping to get us back up to the numbers that we need. We did open the class up as well to have no prerequisites. Before, you had to have some plant biology behind you. Um, but we want to bring more students in potential majors, but also just to get excited about plant science and hydroponics. And um, so we have actually advertised to many different departments. I get a lot of students from math, from art, from business, all over the place. So, um, so we're going to be increasing our advertising for that as well. Now, a couple of things that are in the works um, with this class and the advanced crop production class, which I teach in the spring, is we're going to be working on changing it. It is a three-credit class that has a lab component mixed into it. We're going to split it. So that is a three credit lecture class and then one credit for the lab portion. And one of the big reasons to do this is we can put the three credit lecture part online so we can reach a lot of students that can't actually physically get to the university. So um, and then potentially we will have a lab one credit additional experience for those students to come perhaps early summer where they can just come for an intensive one week for just the lab part if they'd like. Um, and we are also working on cross-listing these classes with the ABE department um, because we want to enhance our program through the ABE department. So um, another upcoming change is the entomology class that I teach in the spring. Um, I would like to offer that one online, so I'm going to work on that. Um, and ABE, so all together, ABE is working on creating a non-engineering science degree that will specialize more in the sustainable ag crop production arena. Um, so that's in the works, a lot of work going into that right now. And we're also going to be working on a certificate program for CE and hydroponics. So uh, not a lot to tell you yet about that, but 
those are in the works. And that is all I have. Okay. And next up, we're going to have Dr. James Ebley. Just one second, maybe. I, I'd like to uh, welcome and introduce Dr. Um, Ana, Ana Rios, just briefly about yourself and welcome. Good morning. My name is Ana. I'm a PhD and lecturer student from the Universidad Nacional de Colombia, that's in Colombia. And uh, uh, um, my major is in engineering. It focuses on uh, control, instrumentation, and automation. I've been applying that in agriculture. Uh, I've been working in uh, low-cost construction sensors applying to agriculture. Uh, I'm here working with, with Dr. Kachira, and we're going to work in uh, monitoring health and growth plants uh, using low-cost uh, camera sensor. So I'm going to be here till uh, December 11. So let's see what's happened. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, James Ebling. Um, I've been here in Tucson for five years, and what I'm reporting on basically is what we've been doing for the last, oh, about probably almost a year, year and a half now. About a year ago, I approached Gene and Kevin about redoing the aquaponics lab, which is located about, oh, about 10 minutes from here. And so we uh, spent the, the, uh, the fall and spring and winter basically digging a lot of trenches and putting in a lot of piping. Yeah. Yeah, welcome to new technology. So um, let me see if I can figure this out. Space bar, arrows, left or right, nothing's happening. I've clicked all of them. Uh, all right, so anyway, so we, we worked on the, the greenhouse for about, um, about, about, uh, about a year now. And, uh, and uh, um, recently I, I found the flyer that Murat had put together on the urban um, aquaculture farm concept. So I plagiarized it, thank you Murat, and put together a little flyer of my own for urban aquaponics, control of our mags, research, education, and outreach, calling it the UA Aqua Farms, okay, to reflect the fact that we're actually using a uh, aquaponics type operation. So we basically gutted the entire facility. This is what it looked like when we started with uh, large tanks. It hadn't been remodeled in many, many, many years. And so we came with a, a new approach to it, which was basically gutting and then starting over again. We had a lot of fun, a lot of crew. We had some graduate students. We actually had some volunteers from the Tucson Aquaponics Project that came in on a Saturday morning for what we call the build out. So we get together, we build something for the project. We had uh, Sean and uh, Neil helping us with the electronics, and Sean and Diego building, digging a lot of trenches. Um, to give you an idea of how hard we all worked, Sean started with a full head of hair. But basically what we did is we converted the first bay into the UA Aqua Farm Aquaponics Research uh, System, consisting of three, uh, two production tanks, about three feet, three and a half, four feet in diameter, currently holding tilapia and then a single media bed that worked as both a uh, growing area and also as a um, biofilter for the conversion of the ammonia produced by the fish into nitrate, which is consumed by the plants. We have two duplicate systems. We just recently finished this system over here, which is a three tank fry fringling system that we can use for, in a sense, growing a complete production system uh, consisting of both the uh, fry uh, through, uh, through grow out and then lots and lots of plants. We had a lot of fun with the plants. The second bay, the middle bay, has basically been undisturbed, except we cleaned it out a little bit. And its idea here is we'd use this for research or graduate students and visiting professors, et cetera. Hani is currently doing a research project in it where he's looking at mineral metal uptake by plants and by, um, By, by plants, and that's an ongoing project that is going to be started up again in a, in a, in a week or so. Um, and then finally, in the third bay, 
This is the one we did the most work on. We pretty much gutted it completely. And then Sean and I put in nine um, raft systems, four by eight feet. And what's nice about these raft systems is when we plumbed them, we plumbed them so that we could actually have each individual raft run as a control or as an experimental treatment. And then also we serpentined the rafts together so we could actually run three rafts as one treatment. We could actually run the entire system as nine rafts as one treatment. So if you wanted to do an uptake study on a particular um, nutrient, you could literally have 10 data points through a, a, a nine raft system at the discharges. Works out really nice. Um, and then we took the, the head house, which really hadn't been much done on it, and we basically did the same thing. We spent uh, days just walking back and forth to the dumpster, um, cleaned out about five, ten years worth of grad student projects, and um, redid it so that we had a, um, Neil helped us with this, this is our data logging system, we have a computer access and an office space, we have a workshop, uh, a laboratory area where we can do basic water quality parameters such as ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, phosphorus, et cetera, using a Hawk system, pH probe, titration, et cetera, and that can be expanded as needed. So that worked out really well. So we've got a completed system that's uh, basically ready to go in terms of doing aquaponic research at the uh, university. Um, and then finally, the other project I worked on that I really wanted to introduce to you um, is the Merchant Gardens project. And it's a 10,000 square foot commercial greenhouse located south of a uh, Broadway on Tucson, built on an old school soccer field. And this is the stuffy greenhouse, 10,000 square feet. Inside, we have put in a 5,000 pound per year production aquaculture facility, raising tilapia from fingerling stage all the way through to grow out, including all the bells and whistles that go with that. Recently, we just added this tank right here, which is a sludge digestion tank. The idea being the solids produced by the fish would then be further decomposed and mineralized in the sludge digester. And those minerals that would normally have been lost to the system are recaptured and injected back into the aquaponic system. The aquaponic system or aquaculture, I mean, the hydroponic system is a standard deep water raft system utilizing a large reservoir, deep water rafts. We have two systems. One are 36 feet, one are 72 feet long. The original production strategy um, we worked out last year we can produce about 400,000 heads of lettuce a year in this facility, designed for the Tucson Unified School District food, uh, food uh, distribution warehouse, which is across the street. So uh, Merchant Gardens has done real well. Aquaponics in Tucson, I think we overlook it sometimes. We really are a leader. I mean, even though we make brag about Gotham Greens and things like that, we have some on-site facilities that are the equivalent of anything you can find in the United States. We have multiple school systems that were constructed in the schools over the past five years. Some of them pretty extensive, pretty pretty sophisticated. Although I'm sad to say that the school just didn't have any interest. Um, we couldn't find the students, we couldn't find the teachers, so I've closed most of those down. Um, but we do have the Controlled Environment Ag Aquaculture Lab. It's ready for business. Um, we, I actually use it quite a bit for outreach with some of the Tucson Aquaponics Project programs. And obviously Hani's using it for research right now. And hopefully at some point we'll use it as an educational tool in some university courses. And then finally, we have some local commercial scale systems such as Merchant Gardens that have been developed and built that are really our prototype examples of relatively low cost, um, owner built farm operations. They're agriculture operations, not the high tech Gotham Greens. These are built by farmers, run by farmers, designed for farmers. So finally, um, I'm done. James is retired for the third time. And I'm now, a, I'm now a graduate student in the Lunar and Planetary Sciences. I start classes on the 21st, 22nd actually. I'm working on a master's or another PhD, who knows. See how long I live. Thank you. Now, what are we doing with switching? See, it works. I don't want to use that. <laughs> no, this is dangerous. Oh, actually, it works. All right, um, I'm Mike Monday. I am a um, 
an associate or, or designated campus colleague or uh, for ABE and, and been around for a while. I have also been around in Tucson now for 56 years. So my community roots are fairly deep. Um, and I, I just figured out that uh, out of that period of time, 15 of my years, 15 of those years, have been spent either in sustainable systems, going back to, gee, oh, way too, way too far back, and, and more recently in controlled environment agriculture, and, uh, and involved with the CEAC. So it's been a, a very interesting experience. Um, what the topic of my, of my talk is today is about how public systems uh, can be um, uh, partnered with for urban food production. And uh, James's uh, uh, discussion of uh, merchant gardens is, uh, is certainly one example of that. The uh, example that we've taken on, uh, that we took on about four years ago, was, is now called the Sustaining Planet Center. And it's uh, planned for a Live, Work, Learn Center in downtown Tucson and the Rio Nuevo District. Uh, it's consistent with the Barrio uh, Viejo neighborhood aspirations. Um, uh, there will be apartments there that are market sensitive and of local design. And uh, along with, it, it, it's on the modern streetcar route and in the commercial district. Um, it's 100 yards from rail to the University of Arizona. So kids can hop on the, uh, um, the, the modern streetcar on campus, and uh, they are, can be 100 yards from where we are. Uh, it's highly visible to nearly a million cars a day along uh, USI-10, and uh, so that's easy access for uh, production distribution and for also for local consumers. Uh, now, this is where, um, where it is. Oh, wait a minute. I want the light. Uh, well, in any event, you see that, 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 the, big, that the big space on the, on the east side, uh, west side, west side. You see all those houses? That's Barrio Viejo. That big piece of vacant land there. That is where we are. And um, there's additional property that the, the city uh, and uh, the, Depart uh, the Arizona Department of Transportation would like us to acquire, but that's not within our first three stages that we're working on right now. And um, if you can see it, um, this is where I need the light. Oh, there it is. Oh. Everyone knows about Caterpillar here in town? Well, you know, Caterpillar is here. So here's Caterpillar, and here's the, the streetcar track. And here we are, right here. I'll show you on this one. Here's Caterpillar. Here we are. So that's what's cooking. And uh, that's uh, the, the conceptual master plan as it stands right now. Um, and I don't think I can make this large. You know, can I make this larger? No, I can't. Um, but in any event, right here is a, oh, you can? Ah, good. There we go. Cool, 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 cool. Um, this is a, uh, well, it's, it's, it says three stories, but I think it's only going to be two stories. But there's a restaurant with a courtyard here that's, that's about 3,000 square feet. And then this is this this footprint here is somewhere between 10 and 12,000 square feet, uh, with two or three stories. Uh, this is the first phase phase, and this is phase one. Phase one is bordered by this line. You see this line? And uh, then we have uh, uh, this is our grow grow house and green. Uh, well, it's a grow house indoor growing and it's it's actually three stories it's not 30,000 square feet what well, this is not the one <laughs> it's supposed to be 24,000 square feet there's a greenhouse over here that's just one floor of a greenhouse there's parking over here there's supposed to be unloading and loading here but this is now a head house god damn it 
Well, in any event, this is the wrong one, but you get the idea, okay? Um, ooh, yeah, now it's too much. I'm real helpful, and then I just uh, break it. Oh, all right. Oh, thank you much. So in any event, uh, this is, um, you know, um, uh, the, you know, the, the uh, entities that are involved in this, uh, have been involved in this, and that are involved in this, are um, Hungry Planets. And Sustaining Planet Center was, was developed by Hungry Planets. And it is a convener um, uh, for, this, for this project. Um, I, I like that term, convener. You know, you convene it. Um, it's not very convenient to convene it. It's been taking forever to do it. Um, <clears throat> The uh, Merge Architecture Group in Phoenix and Brubaker Architects out of Chicago were, uh, have been our, doing a lot of our design work. Um, WLB Group, which is based here in Tucson, uh, are our planners and our engineers. The B from that group, Michael Byrne, um, is not here today. Uh, Arizona South Capital uh, is involved with this, and they are um, our operations and financial uh, partners, and the representative for that is here today, and that's, um, what's her name? Oh, Valerie Rallick. Val Rallick, and there she is, way over here. Um, Valerie and Mike will be um, leading the charge on this. As I go back to China in, um, at, in September, uh, I, I'm, some of you may know, I take my cancer to China. And, and that's what I do, <laughs> and that's what I'm doing. Uh, in any event, the next one is really very important. Uh, these are the other organizations without which we could not do this, and that is the U of A CALS Controlled Environment Agriculture Center uh, and the Department of uh, Ag and Biosystems Engineering. There are a bunch of other educational entities that, are, that we have been discussing uh, partnerships with, and I'll show you a little little image of that in a minute. Um, also, food production equipment and distribution companies. I will not be talking about them today. I will be talking more specifically about the community governmental and quasi-governmental organizations. But I did want you to see the educational organizations that we've been involved with in one way or another. And also one more, and that's Maricopa County Community College. And I see Condon here, and he's not sick today. The last time we tried to get together, you had a cold. Ah! So in any event, um, this is what I want to talk about, really. Uh, this, is, this is critically important if you're going to do a joint, joint program. Um, you know, with Pima County, for, the, for our land partner, we were very much involved in land development and improvement issues with Pima County. We've been doing that for the last three years. Uh, that's critically important, and it's you know it's a it's an uh, it, it's 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 something it's an it, it's sweat equity if you will. City of Tucson, the same thing, land improvement, and they have offered us some additional land uh, at the site uh, for restoration to, to use in restoration. Uh, Barra Viejo neighborhood, uh, my gosh, uh, there they, that's critically important. That that is the the neighborhood around which it is. Uh, one of the things they want us to do is to grow Membrio trees or quince trees. We'll do it, okay? Um, uh, you know, as, as, uh, as um, um, part of the uh, beautification of the area. Uh, the, uh, and also, uh, there, there's, uh, there's the need to, uh, to provide uh, certain economic incentives and, uh, and integrated land use for Barrio Viejo. That, that has been critically important in terms of our negotiations. USDA is providing us with lending, small business research, and community service opportunities. Uh, the U.S. Treasury Department has provided us with opportunities for tax credit programs, very specialized for this project and in the area that it's in, because it is part of the Rio Nuevo Multipurpose Facilities District, the RNMFD. So they are involved with us to do land use and development programming, and they can become our land partners. So that's very, very interesting, and very important stuff. Uh, it's, it's something that we've been working on and for, for many years now, and we are about to see some fruition on it. Um, in any event, 
uh, quick, I just want to show we are also talking with the city of Tucson about uh, involvement, not talking with. We are a part of their RFP, the, the program for the Ronstadt uh, redevelopment, and we'll be working on greenhouse programs there. So there we are, yada, yada, yada. Thank you very much. Well, you can automatic addition. Yeah. All right, and I'll put this timer going so I can scare you. I, I keep doing that. Um, test it out. Thank you all for coming. Uh, today I'll be talking about the greenhouse seed cone uh, production using hand pollination under Evan plot system. Uh, this is a Monsanto uh, supported project and the main objective is to determine the viable kernel yield of the corn in bread lines grown in a greenhouse condition. Uh, why corn? Uh, Corn is the third most cultivated cereal crops in the world. And also many parts of the world, this is uh, the major uh, food crop. And uh, if not for the human beings, definitely some other parts of the world is uh, uh, livestock feed and the fodder. And also this is cultivated for the oil starts and the syrup production and also directly for the biofuels. Uh, we are growing this corn in the greenhouse uh, here in the uh, Evan and Flood system. And the, when this project started in 2015, it was uh, grown in the also the, completely in the drip system. And there were some issues. And 2016, uh, we designed some of this Evan and Flood system uh, right here. And to compare with the, this side is half of the greenhouse is still the drip system to see if this oven and flower system works better than the drip system. So we found some advantages. And then that's uniform, very uniform distribution of the water and nutrient. That was the little problem with the uh, drip system uh, because uh, even this is a pressure compensated or GPH rated and because of the loss of factors and the water distribution is uh, very variable. And so that was the one advantage. And also with the drip system, we are using the very light media, pit and perlite. And when the system is coming on and the, uh, the stakes and the tubes are kind of a jumps out. And imagine in the greenhouse, we have 800 plants growing. It's hard to check every single plant and they're also densely planted. And by, by the time you kind of see it, plants are kind of badly wilted or you lose plants. So we had about 2% of a mortality rate with the drip system, but this system, flood system, we didn't have that problem. And so others is a uh, higher dissolved oxygen. Uh, we also put the aerator to add the oxygens and the recycle, recycle the water and the nutrients. By doing so, we can, we're saving the water and the uh, fertilizer and uh, less polluting, everything they're recycling. That's uh, on the drip system, everything was going on the floor and the ground. Uh, and uh, what other, yeah, that's the kind of a benefits with the, this uh, Evan and Flood system. However, there are some also some issues we have to deal with the, this uh, Evan and Flood system. Uh, one is a high initial cost, and then you have to have those the tables. Uh, tables so you can see this is the tables, it's a size, is a width is 52 and the length is 100 inch. Uh, there are two tables on each side of the walkway. So there are, in each greenhouse we have a 32 uh, tables. And then we need a very kind of a flat and hard surface, otherwise um, these uh, tables 
kind of uh, you know, goes into the ground and because on level and the water distribution is a loss of a mountain and valley. Uh, we have to deal with that and also some uh, LG growth, but we deal with that uh, by adding Paishan, the CLG side every week, uh, 5 ml for 50 gal of uh, Newton solution and also the drain is valves and it's a uh, you know, periodic cleanup, otherwise they get clogged with the LG or any kind of a plant material drops in the table. So uh, this is this just showing, uh, this is the feed line, the greenhouse, our nutrient water, these are solenoids and the feeding to the this uh, table. It's uh, basically it's from the backside uh, here. And this is our walkway. And uh, this is uh, on the drain system, the drain lines, it's all the plumbing from the, all of these uh, tables, so water is draining into these lines and going back. And uh, so this is a return. And from the, all the tables are returning to this, uh, the drainage tank. And from there is a pump to the holding tanks from there and then goes to the, uh, uh, to the tables. Uh, hand pollination, that is the most important part of the, this uh, um, seed corn project. And so greenhouse, uh, all the plants are hand pollinated, and uh, once they reach in uh, reproductive stage, and we have to be constantly kind of checking, make sure that uh, and that we, they are in the right on time. They are cut before any cell comes out. So this is a. Uh, this you can see. These are the years are emerging and the tassels are about to come out. So at this stage, and you can see this is a tiny, this uh, years are emerging. Before the years, as soon as they come out and the, before they put the silk, then we have to bag them. This is called a year suit bagging. These are bagged suits. And then also, this is the female part, and this is the male part. Uh, after the tassel uh, comes out, in two to three days, it starts uh, shedding the pollen. So. So, so why we're bagging this uh, uh, the year? Because there will be floating some of uh, the pollen grains that uh, get, can land into the silk and they get contaminated. We want to I mean, avoid that. That's where that bags are. And then once you start uh, uh, this uh, tassel shedding, about 60 to, uh, 65 to 70 percent, then we bag them. Uh, this is the preparing for the pollination is the day one. And then uh, once they are shedding 65 to 70 percent, we bag them and put the date and initials of the who is doing that. Uh, then female part, we clip the ears and it's a flat, 90 degree, and then they rebag them. That's uh, today. And the tomorrow, you come and we check this silk. We are expecting this kind of a brush tip kind of a silk growth. And if the, there is a nicer silk, and then we collect this pollen from here, and this a bag, we just kind of tap it a few times, and check it, and collect all the pollens, and they drop into this right here. This, this is how this uh, pollination process is done. Now this is complete, and we put this uh, the bag into, into the ears, and wait for three to four weeks, depending upon the genotypes. And then we, they are in the 75 to 90 days, they are ready. And the outside, they come, they depending on the weather condition, and the loss of kind of four to five, sometimes takes a six months. So that's first. And this is uh, actually, uh, uh, this is uh, the last season. So just a few months ago, uh, it was a harvest from the April. And so this is, uh, we have been very successful so far and the very good results, so well filled uh, 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 year. And just for your information, so, and so we have just uh, this year, 2017, we have a uh, pollinated, high end pollinated about 6,000 plus in the years. And uh, so far, can the so good, very promising. And so uh, this uh, work was possible with the help of the following peoples and then the groups, Monsanto company, and Ajay Jones, he's a rep from the Monsanto and uh, uh, UF faculty and the, uh, the engineers and the 
of course, our helpers, students, they do the good job. Thank you. I could see using that for rice. I could see using that for rice. Okay. I'd like to see that, actually. Have you guys considered I'm sorry. Let's use the microphone, please. There are about 15, 20. Have you guys considered, instead of hand pollinating, using some kind of like a battery operated blower below the pollen? <laughs> It just seems like an awful lot of labor to hand pollinate each ear. Yeah, there, I believe that it works. Yeah, they're uh, not for the just uh, for the uh, normal conventional production. This is uh, the uh, seed production. So we have to we do the self pollination and the cross pollination, the back pollination, and uh, there. Are from the certain plants you are pollinating, so you cannot kind of uh, get uh, the pollens everywhere can blow that can contaminate. So you want to maintain the purity. There is certain goals, so, you know. So you are doing the cell. Yeah, could be self within the same plant because the uh, corn is a monoecious plant. It's a male and female, uh, the flower and the same plant, but they develop in the different parts. And so we have to bring the pollens from the, the male part to the female part. So if you are blowing, so where you are blowing, I mean this plant from the, this pollen can go anywhere. That's called so, so cross contamination. Thanks. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the question was, how many plants per greenhouse? We have a, on this uh, in, uh, Polytex greenhouse, uh, they are the bigger. Uh, we have a 32 uh, evident plot tables that contains about 768 plants total, 768. Depending on the density and the, how dense you want to put, so far we are putting on that, uh, no, what did I say, 52 by 100 inch tables, we are putting uh, uh, 24 uh, pots. If you have also questions to our other speakers, Dr. Salafson, Ebeling, uh, and uh, Mike Monday, if, uh, if you have any questions about their presentations, please feel free to ask. I had a question for Stacy. Um, did you do any quantitative analysis on nutrients uh, in the in the crops that you produced with the microbial inoculants? There was a wet weight increase in yield, but did you did you quantify that in, in nutrition at all? No, we, this on? Okay. Um, no, that's as far as we went with it. Um, I didn't have a lot of funding to go get a lot of different analyses done. So. And did you get to observe the microbes in that inoculant, or do they specifically state what they are? Yeah, no, we didn't get that far. Okay. Thank you. Are we ready? I have another question for you, Stacy. Um, have you considered in view of the fact that you seem to be short on numbers of students, have you considered the possibility as part of the mission of SEAC to open 217 to um, so-called non-traditional students in the community, which will then also be introduced into construction and manufacturing of backyard greenhouses? Yes. 
certainly the, the class is open to technically non-degree seeking students, but they would have to go ahead and, and apply to the university. Um, we can't, I don't believe we can co-convene that class with uh, just a non-credit scenario unless they're registered. But that is, the, it's absolutely open to that, yes. Ah, no, we're not doing that. That's a great idea. Ryan uh, Hoffman uh, is working for uh, Monsanto. Um, I, all right. So uh, my name is Ryan Hoffman, and uh, apparently Monsanto doesn't want you guys to know what I'm doing. No, I'm uh, it's not letting me access my files, whatever. But uh, the talk listed on the paper, the itinerary, is not my uh, topic actually. What I'm studying is um, integrated pest management. And like most of us here, we have the desire towards automation, right, in our controlled environments. So uh, right now I'm working on a system that's used to monitor plants from overhead canopy view. And uh, looking down at the canopy, taking a picture with an NDVI camera, which if you guys aren't familiar, it basically is an indicator of plant health based on reflectance of chlorophyll. So taking pictures of these plants from overhead, being able to detect uh, pest pressures, right? So we've all seen what mite damage looks like, and you see how it can turn the plant brown or gray in certain areas, which would reduce the amount of uh, near-infrared reflected from the leaf. So from these uh, pictures, we want to be able to set algorithms, be able to create thresholds so we know when to take action in the greenhouses. Um, more or less, I'm just on the data collection side of things. So once I have all of my pictures, which uh, have a few different occupations, um, basically the way the test is set up, I wish I had some pictures, but I guess I could do something remedial here with a marker. So from an overhead view, I have six plants set up in an enclosure right and I'm taking pictures of the plants that have different uh, factors associated so in each different enclosure I'll have something like mites thrips mites and drought and then just the generic development of the corn and by taking these pictures we're gonna see what the difference is um, in the leaves based on NDVI and so I'm taking the pictures sending them off to an imaging team where they will hopefully be able to create some sort of an application that could be used to automate uh, the insect pressures. The basis for automation is, uh, I'm sure most of you guys know, the greenhouse is going up in Marana. And the way it's set up in the bays is there's not room for a traditional um, integrated pest manager to walk through and observe the plants. So we're really trying to figure out how to narrow in on these insect pressures and know when to take action. Um, on a side note, one of the other projects I'm working on is sticky traps and determining the optimal size of the sticky traps, height, um, brand, and density. So our benches at the site are going to be set up. I don't know if you guys have seen Greenhouse 2 and 4, but they're um, 54 plant per bench so determining what density I'd want to put the sticky traps out at um, and I'm finding a few things out oddly enough blue sticky traps aren't really attractive to anything there the color the color is ac actually pretty negligible from what I've found so far with the results so I don't know if that's some sort of a marketing scam or just the thrips we have here don't like them but there's a few things like that. Uh, height is the next one I'm working on. So I have these stakes set up um, about four feet tall, and I've divided it into four subsections, and I'm looking at which height they like to fly at. So I guess I'm running pretty short on time. Again, I apologize for not having uh, a formal presentation up, but thank you.
Yeah, why don't we, uh, I'll give you this one. Ryan, when it comes to threshold limits on uh, thrips and something as small as like a cyclamen mite, uh, broad mite, russet mites, what type of um, line of sight can, can we expect on early detection for something that small but as devastating as, as those family of mites? Ryan, use the mic. Okay, can you guys hear me? Absolutely. Okay, so the majority of the pressures we can detect overhead with NDVI will be related to mites since they most readily affect the color of the leaf. Um, as far as pressures from thrips go, that's hopefully what we'll be able to detect from our sticky traps. The question was, uh, what about the efficacy from a thick canopy? Uh, how are you going to see things from up high? Right. So um, I guess that's also one of the things we're working on right now is determining how many plants we should put on per pinch, right? We want to keep the, the canopy fairly clear for reasons such as green bridging, but also to be able to detect these pressures, right? So say we do have the 54 plant bench top. Um, is it more efficient to reduce the number of plants by maybe five to ten and losing those or is it uh, more efficient to be protective and be able to detect these things so the thickness of the canopy isn't really um, something I'm worried about it's going to be a general overview and I don't think it's going to be uh, at the individual plant level either it's I don't know if you've seen how a lot of the NDVIs work with the drones very far overhead but we're looking at a very general picture here. Just a quick question. Uh, you said that the, the thrips were not, uh, or, or thrips, thrips, whatever, uh, were not going to your blue stickies, right? Correct. Might they be repulsed by the blue? Uh, I'm not sure if they're necessarily repulsed by the blue. Um, I haven't run enough tests to really have any significant data to say that the thrips don't go to blue at all, but it's clear that they like yellow better. I don't know if like is even the right word to use, um, but I'm trying to keep all of the factors negligible, such as uh, placement, so that nothing else is tying into it. So, but as far as I can see, yeah, they don't like the blue. Uh, anybody else? Okay, I think we're gonna. Um, give a short break here. You may want to enjoy some water and, and some of the drinks and you may have other needs. So please, let's uh, be here on time again. In 10 minutes, we will start. We have uh, presentations uh, to follow. And those of you who did not have a chance to upload your presentations, please do that during the break. And thank you. All right.
Okay. I think, uh, I hope you had a little bit of time to, to rest and enjoy the drinks. And uh, so we're going to start again. And before we start with the next presentation, I just would like to remind that we have lunch uh, that will be here in this in this room, and Austin is working on that. And you're all invited to join us for the lunch. So, um, okay. So we have some people come in. All right. Uh, next speaker is Miles Lewis. Miles. Research Retreat 2017. Damn, I'm bald. That's why I have to keep this. <laughs> I've got to do this thing. Don't mind me over here, but you see the uh, camera just, um, you know, it's not clicking. So just do it. Do I just have to do the arrow thing? Okay, cool. Test these, test them. Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Miles Lewis. For those of you who don't know me or remember me, uh, for those of you that do remember me, it's another drama mean requiring shirt for you to stare at for five minutes. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about what I've been doing year to date for 2017. Uh, I've got several different projects here at the SEAC that I've been collaborating on and acting as a contractor. So that we know I'm Verdant Earth Technologies and the Arizona Vegetable Company. I am not UA faculty or student. I was a student and a technician, but I went off and branched out on my own. You guys might remember me from the Professional Science Master's McGuire program in 2010, long time ago. First, we're doing the hydroponic leafy greens intensive course. Um, some of you may have heard about this. This is a course that I developed in 2012 in collaboration with the U of A CEAC. And we've been doing this for now five years. We did it one time per year, and now we're doing it four times per year. We've upped the ante a little bit. We're charging now $1,195 per class, or excuse me, per student. And we estimate that 10 to 25 students show up each time. This is people who are industry reps, growers, people looking to be growers, hobbyists, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, uh, people looking for just a single nugget of information that they know we at the CEAC and myself have, uh, and they want to come get it. It's open to the general public. Um, we're estimating that by the year end, we'll have somewhere north of $70,000 worth of revenue. So this is a very high revenue generating program that we put together. It's everything to become a grower. Uh, it's nutrition, IPM, putting the greenhouse together, stuff about plants. It's not specific to lettuce, so we're trying to change it up a little bit because we also talk about leafy greens as well. You do about 40 hours. We squeeze in 40 hours of in-class personal time with me uh, across a three and a half to four day period, which is pretty impressive. So we offer almost 10 to 12 hours a day of instruction, which gets a little haggering in case you're wondering. The October course date is set, and so we're setting up right now. It's going to be in the greenhouses just out here in the H block. And uh, we're discussing what 2018 is going to look like. Premier Tech Horticulture, a major Canadian manufacturer of peat moss, has been supp uh, supporting several projects. <clears throat> First, we did a field transplant project for the last year. That included five trials across four seasons, a one-year-long project growing tomato, lettuce, and broccoli transplants for the field. And the idea was to test 40, actually it was more than 40, it was 50, 60, 70 different substrate blends of different compositions, different additives at different concentrations. So it was a pretty big trial. Unfortunately, it was blind to us, so I could not tell you really what the additives were or what the, what the results were. I can simply show you pictures of what they looked like. And so we got some very neat results, but unfortunately, it's being analyzed by Premier Tech, and we haven't had the results yet to present to you. So stay tuned, please. Based upon that uh, trial that was very successful, we decided to go into a round two using tomatoes. So we're going to be doing a substrate test again, growing tomatoes which is more or less the SEAC tomato classic study where we're just going to grow high wire tomatoes, cultivar spadella, and we're, again, we're going to be featured in the H block over here testing against commercially available substrates. So this is private industry funding supporting us. Um, the same is going to happen actually for the strawberry house. Uh, if you remember, Dr. Kubota recently left to OSU, 
And so she's going to be collaborating with us on the Strawberry Project, evaluating substrates once again, also funded by Premier Tech Horticulture. There we go. Something more interesting, we're doing a hops research demonstration right now out in the greenhouses here. We haven't really talked about it yet, but that's been going on for about two and a half months now. We're getting close to the end. And the idea was to just grow varieties of hops. We wanted to see how do they grow, what kind of characteristics do they exhibit, what kind of data can we collect, is it even going to grow in southern Arizona to begin with and be a viable crop to look at in the future. So we've been absorbing and recording plant growth as it occurs, flowers, cones, fresh weight, dry weight. <clears throat> we assembled a representative production system, something very close to a high wire production system for tomato because we thought that would be commercially representative of what a commercial scale operation would want to put together. Um, and we're monitoring the cost right now. The value to Arizona is that there's approximately 72 plus breweries in the state of Arizona who would all use this high value product. Uh, product. It's a high value premium product available at limited times of the year. So we can increase that a little bit at least uh, and offer it more times per year doing greenhouse growth or controlled environment agriculture growth. <clears throat> yes, that's right. Not many people have been doing this. Colorado State University, Michigan State, a couple of the universities are starting to look at this, but they're only a couple years into it at best. So we have a pretty good opportunity right now to start evaluating this as a very serious crop for the state of Arizona. Um, we've been very pleased with the results so far, so stay tuned and I'll have more results for you on that well as well. The information I can give to you is what it cost us to do the research project as it stands right now. We spent approximately $18,000 to execute a 90-day trial. Uh, that accounts for about $70, $17 per square foot over the course of that three months. Um, $10,000, excuse me, $11,000 was spent in hardware with the balance being spent across student labor, which includes Sean McBride, who's in the back. Thank you, Sean. He defected from James Ebeling because he got tired of the hair jokes. So he came over to us. <laughs> Sorry. He wasn't here to defend himself. But anyway, um, more importantly is the cost to repeat this study. Or not to repeat the study, but repeat the demonstration so that we can learn a little bit more the next time around. Because it's already set up, because we completed the setup, because we enslaved Sean, the operational cost will be way lower, almost a third of what it was, if not less, than the previous time because the equipment already exists. So the cost to repeat we're estimating to be around $4,500, give or take. So we're really encouraging phase twos in all the projects we got because the setup is one of the most expensive parts. So unrelated to SEAC, um, you might remember me from 2010. I did a patent on a shipping container based growth chamber. I was actually awarded the patent in 2013. Go Miles. I'm still continuing on that, so I've been doing the continuation and patent. So I've been filing additional features to go into the ship container-based growth chamber system and then doing licensing activities and things of that nature. So you can see multispectral airflow light, which was granted, uh, different airflow patterns, different designs for the raft, the lighting systems, airflow, uh, carbon dioxide generation from both bacteria and fungal sources. So. We're hoping that Slow and Steady won the race back in 2010. Um, if you like anything that I said, go thank one of these people. And the only person I didn't mention on here is Austin, actually. So thank you to Austin. He's, he's been greatly helpful in administering and getting all these projects done, especially the intensive. So thank you. Thank you.
If it's not working, it's not click on the screen. Okay. Uh, my name is Sean McBride. I'm working in applied biosciences with a focus in controlled environment agriculture. Just to quickly, because I've only just been added to the Hops project, like Miles said, we've been running for only two and a half months, effectively. Um, what I actually started in was in aquaponics, and we were doing a rebuild for the past year on two bays of that system. I was also able to participate in a number of other groups like the Controlled Environment Ag uh, Student Association. And there was a rooftop garden competition put on by the student unions, which uh, was open to all types of students from all backgrounds. Uh, two of our teams actually ended up taking first and third place. So kudos. Um, able to have a lot of fun, even jumped in on a few of the uh, lettuce intensive courses, which got me interested in expanding beyond aquaponics into the more traditional hydroponic setups. And this is how we got to the hops project. Um, as Miles was saying, this is really just an initial evaluation to make sure that this crop could, in fact, grow in a greenhouse. There is limited research and, in fact, almost no research in terms of what it will happen when it's in the greenhouse environment. There's lots of field studies that have been done, but that doesn't always translate. So we're really starting from the very, very base and just confirming that different varieties can grow here, um, that we can, in fact, grow the, uh, grow the cones. And uh, this is a good example of a uh, fully developed one. Um, a lot of what we've been doing so far has just been really, really the basic data collection on this. And it's so early that we really don't have fully formed results beyond just our observations. So um, we are looking to continue with this project um, into the future. And a um, couple of interesting points would be photo period, nutrition, and uh, substrate evaluations. So, all right, that's, that's hops. Thank you. Thanks, Morat. Uh, good morning, everyone. Let's just wait a little bit for um, the slides to come on. How is everyone doing? Very good. <laughs> Thanks, Morat and Jin, for organizing this uh, retreat. It's very useful. OK, thanks. All right, so I'm going to talk about the VHive Green Box, which is pertaining to vertical farm. So the last two years, my biosystems engineering group has uh, developed three original designs uh, for um, algae photobioreactors for mass production of algae. So this time we turned our attention on designing something original for uh, vertical farming. All right, and in the last two years, I've also been evangelizing on a new paradigm for vertical farming, which is the minimally structured modular and prefabricated vertical farm. I've talked about this earlier this year here at CAC, so I'm not gonna uh, regurgitate it. But essentially, uh, the idea is that you've got a building uh, that has modular units. It's minimally structured and it's modular. And uh, you can treat this as a platform or a so-called operating system. And so therefore, you can design various growing systems applications, so to speak. And uh, each one of these can fit into the standardized uh, modular uh, units. And of course, it does not preclude for the modular units to be used shipping containers. But they don't have to be shipping containers. So speaking of shipping containers, uh, this uh, year, um, we were given a grant by the UA Green Fund uh, with a group of students we refer to as the cats in the green box uh, to work on uh, the Arizona Green Box, which is a used shipping container uh, that is retrofitted for crop production. Um, so I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures uh, where um, students 
essentially uh, ordered and uh, then they decided to um, retrofit the shipping container. So this is now found on campus uh, on the side of Shantz Building where Ag and Biosystems Engineering is located. Okay, thanks. So, um, so we have this uh, promotional here, Arizona Green Box, same planet, better crops. And so we have a bunch of students who come in and look at the system uh, for educational purposes. And uh, the students are, are playing with all sorts of uh, crops being grown in the green box. But at the same time, we wanted to come up with something original, and that is the V-Hype green box. And the objective really is to design a growing system structure or the app for the modular green box that will allow for maximum crop production given the available volume of space. So each modular unit has a finite volume and of course you want to be able to maximize the use of that volume. You don't want to waste any of that volume. You want to produce crop in every portion of that volume. And this applies not only to a shipping container but this applies to a warehouse as well. So if, if you're not utilizing volume, there's that volume, uh, then that would be uh, not very economical. So I got the inspiration from a beehive box. <laughs> so that is why we refer to it as the beehive green box, where V stands for vertical. So these are some of the initial sketches. These are my uh, co-inventors, Cody Brown, Ryan Sullivan, um, Philander, and Yasser Medipur. So anyway. So we came up with uh, some sketches here. The idea is that you've got these lighting boards and you've got the growing boards. And um, essentially, you can imagine this to fill the entire volume of the module. And so that you can access the plants and the lights, uh, you can slide them out of the module and you can slide them back in. And the spacing between the lighting board and the growing board is also adjustable. And of course, it's possible to have two growing boards side by side and sandwich, sandwich between two lighting boards. So you can reconfigure this as you wish. And also the spacing between the um, hydroponic growing systems could also be made slidable. So this is a completely flexible, adjustable uh, system based on the crop species that you are growing and depending on the volume that is available. Um, this could be transparent or not. Okay. Uh, this one is the vertical embodiment, so instead of horizontal, they could actually be vertical. But essentially, you've got the same uh, degrees of freedom in terms of the movements of the lighting boards and the um, growing boards. Or they could be mixed. Okay, so now it's time to do a prototype and this is uh, Yasser Medipur, who is a visiting scholar in ABE, uh, who actually built the prototype. So as you can see in here, this one is the, let's see. So you've got the growing board, you've got the lighting board, growing board, and so on and so forth. And then there's a track on which they are positioned so that they could be slid in and out. So in here, uh, we built a uh, removable uh, track extension so that you can pull out the lighting board or you can pull out the growing board. Okay, and this one is actually the reservoir for the nutrient solution, which is covered. And this one is showing you the plumbing system that will take the nutrients into the top uh, portion of the growing board and it will be flowing by gravity. So now the students are playing with it, growing all sorts of plants, and so far, so good. They're growing uh, well. Now we're using uh, fluorescent lamps here, which are not the best lamps. So the next step is for us to acquire the LED uh, lamps uh, to make this more up to date. And we're also talking with a number of uh, plant factory companies uh, who expressed uh, some initial interest. So this could also be the V-Hive aquaponics, where uh, instead of just the growing board, you can also have an aquaculture board, as shown. Or it could be purely aquaculture as well. But the idea, again, is that this will fit into a modular unit. 
Um, so this is the uh, president of uh, the Association for Vertical Farming, Kristen Zimmerman, when she visited earlier this year. These are some visiting scholars from the Philippines. Um, this is Mr. Manikandan from India, uh, who has expressed interest in developing uh, green boxes in India. Because as you know, in India, especially in urban centers, there's a severe shortage in uh, drinking water and as well as food. So he's got this idea of sustainably producing crops, fresh crops in urban areas. Um, we're also in talks with the United Arab Emirates uh, to uh, build some of these green boxes, as well as in the Philippines. So the hope is that in the near future, we'll be able to uh, have a build a green box global network where all of these green boxes and their operators, whether they're students or commercial companies, can interact with one another, communicate with one another, so that they could learn from one another as well. So these are my students and visiting scholars working on this, plus other projects during the summer. Uh, this is Professor Tiyoki Kozai in Japan, who is considered a father of vertical farming. And this is just a throwback picture that I wanted to show back in 1999 uh, with his uh, grad students at Chiba University. So we were parting like it's 1999 because it was 1999. <laughs> that was fun. I was there as a Japan Society for the Promotion of Science uh, short-term visiting fellowship. Okay, and that's it. Thank you. Do you need this? Uh... Okay, good, because then I can do this. So you can kind of see yourself. See if I can actually show up in the yeah. shot or not. Probably here is most comfortable. <laughs> the shot, no. Okay, I'll just start talking. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Sean Gallenbeck. Um, I'm the other Sean. Spelled the same way, so good job. <laughs> Thank your parents for me. <laughs> uh, I work with, I'm actually a graduate student in the Systems and Industrial Engineering Department, uh, but I work with the Luna Greenhouse Cross Street, that, that direction, yes. Um, <clears throat> so we are actually coming to the end of our current funding cycle, but I wanted to talk about what we accomplished over the summer and in that last phase of our research. Sad. Just made it not work again. Okay, cool. All right, so give you a basic idea of what we're looking at. If you actually travel anywhere in space, you're likely going to need to bring most of your resources with you. Um, that's true, that's been true in any space flight ever. The International Space Station has consistent resupply missions in order to have enough resources to provide for the astronauts. So if you go anywhere outside of low Earth orbit or even to the moon, it's about a three day trip. Uh, Mars is a six month trip one way at shortest. That's when they're closest together. So you're going to have to be able to have a permanent planetary base, this base of operations where you can provide the resources you need for your astronauts in situ or where you are. <clears throat> so with this is something that we're working on across the street, our prototype Martian Lunar Greenhouse. The idea is to provide bioregenerative life support, which is life regenerating, regenerating itself providing life support for your astronauts. That's in terms of oxygen, fresh water, as well as calories, of course. This is an older shot from a couple of years ago when we had our high pressure sodium lights in the system. We've now transitioned to LEDs and that's a lot of what we did this summer. <clears throat> uh, something important to mention here is our polycultivation. We grow to have a consistent and varied diet for your astronauts, you want to be able to have multiple crops grown in the same small space, if you can. Um, the reason for that is 
there's two, if you ever design anything for space, your top two concerns are low mass and low volume. So spacecraft are completely different, but all of them are very lightweight and are all at least compact or compressible that they can deploy once they get into space. And that's just constraints of uh, rockets, essentially. <laughs> All right, so this is our Martian Lunar Greenhouse today. We actually have two units open. These are modular units. And we have our unit one. I don't think this works. Ah, it does. Cool. So this is our unit one. We're using a lighting system by Philips. Our, I think Green Power, Green Power Top Lights is the actual full name. But it's a, an array of red and blue LEDs. And our unit two next to it is cool white LEDs. Um, a design that Phil Sadler, who we work with, is actually working on creating. <clears throat> what we're doing right now in our current cycle is actually comparing the growth uh, characteristics of the different plants that grow in these two systems next to each other. <clears throat> the, we are working on getting all the data together to actually understand the uh, biomass, the fresh weight output from both of these two systems on average. But some of the characteristics that we've seen just from the students harvesting, as you can see, there's these two heads of lettuce, both red oak lettuce, same variety, grown for the same period of time and just in these two different systems. Uh, these two chambers do share air and their fertigation system, so it's just the light is the only major difference between the two. And you'll notice from unit one we have what we kind of colloquially refer to as this compression that we've noticed. Uh, these leaves of the lettuce head are more compact. You'll notice more uh, a darker color, and that's the, the anthocyanin production. And it seems to be more in the plants from unit one as compared to unit two, which is broader, larger leaves, less compact. <clears throat> and there's the roots right there. They're very, fairly similar. The unit ones actually go to about there. It's hard to see in these pictures in the unit two tips out there. <clears throat> so this, like I mentioned, the morphological differences, and we are working on actually understanding the fresh weight differences and the dry weights as well. Let's see. Something else we've been working a lot on is our outreach at Biosphere 2. This is our outreach and teaching module. It's been up there for now, I think almost two years. I've been personally up there taking care of it for the last year. I would go up once a week, trim everything, make it look nice and pretty, and then uh, come back down. <clears throat> so we, one of our big accomplishments actually during this last year is we replanted that entire chamber. We selected all new uh, plants to grow in there. Uh, when I started, it was pretty much just sweet potatoes, sweet potato vines everywhere, <laughs> which is cool. They grow really fast, but it's not when you don't have the understanding in the background in plants and plant physiology, it's kind of like, okay. <laughs> so we replanted. We still have sweet potatoes in there, but they're actually under control. And we've got uh, several different types of tomatoes. We've got peppers. We use basil. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have a few types of cucumbers and strawberries as well. Um, so give a, a nice variety of very familiar plants for the outreach to the public so they can understand what CEA is all about and what our project of bioregenerative life support is about as well. Do, do, do. Oh, so this is one of the more recent pictures from the outside of the OTM. This is what the actual patrons to Biosphere 2 will see. I think that's actually my last slide. Of course, you can never do a project alone, um, so uh, several long list of acknowledgments to all that we've worked with. And that's all I have to say. I'll be happy to take questions at the break. Yeah, next up we've got Dr. Barry Pryor. Which one was it on here? What was the name? All right, good morning. Oh, should there be, there's, uh, da, 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 should be that one, a long slip. Very good. good. All right, good morning. Well, we've been hearing a little bit of discussion about um, 
organisms in the kingdom plantae, right? And then we've heard a little bit of discussion about organisms in the kingdom animalia, or aquaculture. And now we're going to jump into something a little bit different, a little a different kingdom, uh, creatures in the kingdom of fungi. And I'm going to be uh, speaking today about uh, controlled environment mycoculture. And I teach a lot, so I like to bring along some visual cues. And I like to bring this along because a lot of people are unfamiliar with mycoculture, unfamiliar with fungi. And so this is, represents our sort of our goodwill ambassador. So all of you folks who, who feel you're not familiar with fungi or might be a little intimidated by fungi, I'm going to leave this over here so you can just walk over here and pet the fungus and sort of get to know the fungus, the mushroom, so that um, you can uh, walk away from the appreciation of what we're trying to do here. Um, let's see. Okay, so um, I'm. This is a new program here at SEAC, and we've been doing this for about two years now. I'm sort of the newest SEAC member, so I'd like to give a little bio on myself. And I graduated with a bachelor's in botany from UC Santa Cruz, followed by a master's in integrated pest management and PhD in plant pathology. And PhD in plant pathology sort of brought me together, fungi and plants together. And then you can see here that in the, between my bachelor's and my master's, I did 10 years in the industry with food processing uh, 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 industries in California. And there I got really a, an appreciation for food production and food processing. And so I hope I can bring that appreciation and some of those skills to SEAC in order as we develop our, um, our uh, food production systems. And I, whoops, I uh, got here in 2001. Um, my areas of research in, include mechanisms of pathogenesis, plant pathogenesis, management of fungal diseases in vegetable crops, tree crops, field crops, um, evolution, you know, some basic biology here, some basic ecology, evolution of species concepts in fungi, particularly asexual fungi, which this one is not. Um, uh, fun fungal community structures and native ecosystems. Uh, production of toxic secondary fungal metabolites, fungal arrow allergens on childhood asthma. We have some collaboration with the College of Medicine. And then finally, most recently, like within the last two years, the development of specialty and medicinal mushroom production systems in controlled environment and sustainable systems. And, 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 and we do a lot of outreach. So here I am up in Mount Lemmon with some students on a fungal foray looking at uh, native species of mushrooms. Now, um, how this relates to SEAC uh, is that mushroom production is really a controlled environment activity. It's done at, performed in controlled environment facilities. And again, we're controlling three parameters, temperature, humidity, CO2, precisely controlling these for maximum production. And I want to emphasize right here that really there are two different kinds of production systems for mushrooms. One are, are these open beds under pasteurized substrates, pasteurized substrates, not sterile substrates. And this kind of production system we find most in the button mushrooms, the portobellos, the cremini's, the field mushrooms, right? And then there is another type of production system, and these are are performed on sterilized substrates in sterilized bags or jars. These are the specialty mushrooms, the gourmet mushrooms. And these are the ones I'm going to talk about. And these are the ones I'm most interested about in controlled environment facilities because these are precisely controlled systems. These are axenic systems. And as such, they can be very nicely predictable, very predictable. And that's important as we start moving in these production systems for uh, different kinds of environments and perhaps extreme environments. Now, today I'm going to talk a little bit about our vision and our research trajectory. As I said, this is sort of a new program, so we're, we're developing infrastructure right now. But really, we like to, our, our, our objectives are really the same objectives that we have here in CALS, research, extension, and, and, and education. And our research uh, activities right now are conducted over a small hoop house over on Allen Road, again, about over by the aquaculture facilities. And in this facility, we're talk, we do studies on um, yield and bioefficiency, modifying substrates, modifying temperature and humidity control to increase yield, mainly for the mushroom industry, the mushroom industry, because this is what the growers are interested in, yields. And then we have our extension program is highlighted over at Tucson Village Farms, where we have this very cool solar-powered mushroom grow house. And we bring students in to uh, visit this facility, teach them about mushroom production, teach them about ecology, teach them about sustainability, right? And then, of course, on campus, we have my educational component where we have students growing mushrooms in modified growth chambers up on campus in the Marley Building. And again, we're trying to integrate these three components, these three missions of CALS within the concepts of mycoculture. All right. Um, oops. Okay. So mushrooms. 
the greenest source of protein, the greenest source of protein, right? So mushrooms are approximately 30, 40% dry weight protein. And this is high quality protein. Basically, it has all nine essential amino acids in roughly the same ratio you find in egg. First class protein source, no cholesterol, high in fiber, low in fat, no trans fat, low in calories. And if you're ever are curious and want to taste what mycoprotein is like, go to Whole Foods and buy this product here called corn, Q-U-O-R-N. It's a mycoprotein, develops in the 60s, uh, uh, European uh, enterprise. And if you compare this to corn, which is about 10% dry weight protein, which is deficient in three essential amino acids. And I ask you, which is the, which is the highest, the higher quality protein source? Okay, now in terms of sustainability, this is just some information I put together to compare some of these metrics of sustainability um, that we might measure our, our production systems with and compare our normal production systems of, of, of protein with that, uh, or normal protein production systems with that protein, uh, mycoprotein production systems. And here we have the average square foot required to produce 1,000 grams of protein, and we're comparing beef, and you're gonna, gonna see here a, an interesting contrast. Beef is always the worst, and mushrooms are almost always the best. So if we look at here, average uh, square foot required to produce 1,000 grams of protein, we have beef, pork, poultry, eggs, dairy, mushrooms. The lowest footprint, the smallest footprint to produce 1,000 grams of protein. Average amount of feeds, such as like, um, uh, substrate like grain or straw or something like this. It's going to go into these protein production systems and we compare beef, pork, poultry, eggs, dairy, mushrooms again. The most sustainable. Now we look at average gallons of water. This is important for Arizona, right? Important for Arizona. It produced a thousand grams of protein, <laughs> right? And this is an unusual one because people think that mushrooms require all kinds of water. But if you look at it, beef again, it's the worst. Pork, poultry, eggs, dairy, mushrooms, there is a little bar in there. Mushrooms are highly efficient in their use of water to produce protein. And then, of course, we have this other metric that's very important today in terms of global warming, kilograms of CO2. This is an interesting one. Kilograms of CO2 gen to create, generated when you produce 1,000 grams of protein. Beef, pork, poultry, eggs, dairy, ah, mushrooms, look at that. Oh, my God, it's, we can't use it at all. But we can use it. We can use it. And um, Caitlin Hall, a student, an ABE student, uh, graduated in 2016, did a really, really nice study in integrating mycoculture with other kinds of production systems, vegetable production systems in greenhouse, linking them together. And she was looking at energy and resource flux and flow between these two systems and seeing if, in fact, we could utilize the CO2 that the mushrooms were producing. And she did a wonderful job. Finding, uh, looking at the ventilation from the, the mushroom, the mycoculture home or facility into the lettuce production facility, back into the mycoculture facility, rotating this, leaking them together again. And she found that mushroom house energy use comparisons and the lettuce house in energy use comparison in most situations, most times of the, uh, of the year, we find a decrease in energy use when we link these systems together, decrease in energy use. Uh, during daytime, during nighttime, and most of the time of the year. But then if we look at our water use comparison, linking these together, a decrease in water use at all times of the year. Okay, very nice work that Caitlin, that Caitlin did here. Okay, so people ask, can we produce mushrooms sustainably in the desert? And if we look at our square footage and our, uh, and our, and our water uses, of course we can. In highly efficient controlled environment facilities. And I want everybody to start thinking, when they see this, these are the feedlots of the future. These are the feedlots of the future. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Mike likes that. Okay. And then we have to talk about all these wonderful nutraceuticals, right? The conjugated lin linoleic acids, anti-carcinogens. Beta-glucans are effective immunomodulators for both the adaptive and the, um, and the innate uh, uh, an innate immune response, ergothenine, antioxidants, those wonderful statins that reduce cholesterol production by, liver, by the liver, and then these, these, these hormone modifiers that are really important to use in our fight against certain kinds of cancers. Okay, and this is a really amazing industry right now. It's growing by leaps and bounds, and all you have to do is go look at the nutritional supplement count, uh, rows in the grocery stores, and you're going to find things like my community, U.S. organic grown mushrooms, right? Okay, mycoimmunity. These are, these are really uh, uh, 
area of, of importance. And so we are developing right now grants funding to, pr to move this program forward. And we just recently received the um, 2000 and, uh, uh, through the University of Arizona RDI program, the Research Discovery Innovation Program, and through the Water Environment and Energy Solutions Initiative and the Accelerate for Success award, uh, program, we were awarded a 2017 uh, grant, Advancing Mycoculture for Enhanced Nutraceutical and nu Nutritional and Nutraceutical Properties, Resources, PIs, uh, myself, Murad Kassir is our engineer, Andrew Weil, the director of Center, uh, Arizona Center of Integrated Medicine, is going to help uh, advise and spearhead some of our nutraceutical uh, studies. And then Melanie Hingle in the Department of Nutritional Sciences, she's going to help move the uh, evaluation of uh, the nutritional properties of mushrooms. And again, we're going to be modifying the environments, the, the CO2 level, uh, water, uh, water level, temperature, as well as the substrate to see if we can modify and enhance uh, certain nutritional properties, amino acid ratio, vitamins, certain nutraceutical enhancements, beta-glucans, ergosterol, which is an anti-inflammatory uh, compound, and including melanin. And melanin is the one we're going to bring in here because it's been shown that melanin, or the consumption of, 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 of foods with high melatonin content, can help protect us from certain types of radiation. Okay? And so this is really, and we're going to look at optimization, we're going to look at automation of this process. As we move this food production system forward, he, uh, for Arizona and for other and, and for other environments. Okay, extension and education. Um, we have several different organizations that we worked with so far. The MycoCats is a student organization funded by the Green Fund for several years. And we've over 70 students have been trained to date in our mycoculture program. We have the Arizona Mushroom Growers Association. This program was funded through the Arizona Department of Agriculture. This year we got our second year of funding very nicely and. Amazing. We have 70, 65 members signed up for the Arizona Mushroom Growers Association. This shows the interest in industry, in mycoculture in Arizona, in this desert environment. And then, um, and this is going to fit in very nicely with our teaching components, our teaching mission. Um, here are some of the classes we teach about fungi in the School of Plant Sciences, Mushrooms, Molds, and Man, Introductory Plant Pathology, I teach, Introductory Mycology, Mark, uh, 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 Mark Orbach teaches, and then this is the new class gene that we're going to be putting together. Mushroom cultivation, right? Coming soon. New SEAC class. All right. Student part engaging student partnerships and commercial partnerships for SPIR programs, for microremediation, microfuseuticals, microengineering, and then of course protein production in extreme environments. EEA. This is sort of a subsidiary of CEA, right? EEA. And so we're going to look at micro, micro protein production in, as a sustainable industry in diverse cropping system, um, research into automation and energy use, recycling for advancing food production systems in extreme environments, underwater on the continental shelf, lunar greenhouse, and our program here, Mushrooms to Mars. This is our vision. This is our vision. All right. I went through that very fast. Did I make it in 10 minutes? There you go. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, a lot of <laughs> hey, Jeff, can you me pass? Dr. Pryor, is that correct? Yes. Uh, my question is, are there any varieties, cultivars of mushrooms that lend themselves well to, uh, say, a cover crop style application, something that would facilitate the synergism between fungi and plant tissues, uh, the rhizosphere? That's an interesting uh, term you use as cover cropping because as a cover crop, we tend to plant our cover crops to recycle and enhance our production system. And, and so I don't know if we could think of it quite like that, but we do use mushrooms to recycle nearly any sort of plant debris all of us can generate, whether it's going to be uh, um, corn silage, whether it's going to be sorghum bagasse, whether it's going to be almond holes or pecan shells, we can recycle those. So in a sense, it's kind of like a cover crop. 
I would imagine. And again, extracting those resources, closing energy loops, closing resource loops, uh, increasing the sustainability of a diverse cropping system. Question. All right, you want to direct that? And then, uh, Dr. Pryor, this one's also for you. Um, but uh, Ella online, she asks, um, how do mushrooms compare to beans in terms of footprint and protein? I don't have those data in terms of beans specifically. Um, those are those are very good questions. There's a lot we're still discovering right now about microculture. I mean, my, we've been doing microculture for many, many, for centuries, for centuries. But right now we're moving it into these, these more closely and mm, highly studied systems and extracting these metrics that we're going to need to optimize them. So um, I, I don't have that. Those, those data at this point. Okay. Yeah. All right. uh, Dr. Pryor, um, you know, it occurs to me that, um, especially here in the, in the desert, you've got to um, not only humidify correctly for, your, for growing your mushrooms. 85-90 percent humidity. You've also got to be mindful of the temperature particularly mindful of the temperature. Uh, the question then that I have is, is there a, uh, how does growing uh, mushrooms compare with the other, you know, your other bar charts uh, items, the bar chart items in terms of energy, energy use? In, in, in terms of energy, well, Caitlin Hall did a very nice study in terms of energy required to um, light and to heat and to cool, because that's also very important. And that's another energy consideration. Um, we've mentioned temperature control, humidity control, and CO2 control. So we need to vent. That requires energy. We need to heat or cool. And in the desert here, we need to cool. We don't need to heat. Almost never have to heat. In Pennsylvania, growing mushrooms, in the wintertime, you have to heat. You might burn uh, natural gas to do that. In Arizona, in the summer, you need to cool. You can do that with solar. So uh, there's, uh, there's clearly an energy savings in, pr in producing mushrooms over uh, many other cropping systems. I'm not sure if I answered that correctly. I'm sorry, Mike. Well, uh, yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking for a comparison of costs. But you, you, the, the, you don't have that data. I, 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 pro I probably don't have it right. Okay. Right uh, and the other thing you mentioned is about solar. What, what, is, is there a cost in terms of putting in a solar, solar system? Um, Here's where I'm going to need the help of some of these economists yeah. and okay. engineers to come up with this. I'm just a mycologist. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I had, I had a question for uh, Joe and, and, and maybe Barry as well. But um, so, could a green box feed a family of four? Can a green with, box with, with mushrooms? <laughs> Can a green box feed a family of four in one year with salad crops and uh, mushroom? I haven't done the calculations, but I think it potentially, yeah, I think so. Well, because I see these uh, Mars greenhouses and stuff, and it's just one. Is that, is that really so good? I think if you're if you're talking about a footprint rod, I think it could, depending on how tall you made that box. <laughs> so um, actually, there's been some studies that uh, have been conducted at NASA Johnson Space Center over 10 years ago, and then recently in China, in Beijing, uh, at uh, Beihang University, where they had three crew members inside a closed, probably as big a shipping container or two shipping containers, in terms of volume, and they stayed in there for about uh, close to a year and all they had to feed on were the crops that they were growing plus some some insects <laughs> and they survived and they were fine so I think potentially yes the answer is yes I can actually speak to the the Martian lunar greenhouse the idea from the size we have uh, our chambers are they're cylindrical and about two meters across, so six feet across, and five meters deep. That's uh, 15 feet. Um, 
and that should be able to provide all the oxygen, all the water, and half the calories for one person. So that kind of gives you the idea of the, the growing area of 10, 10 square meters. Yeah, about 10 square meters should be able to provide about half for one person. As you've described some of the variables here, one of the cycles that I've not heard mentioned is nitrogen. And perhaps I'm naive in regard to the way plants are able to capture nitrogen. Is it the formation of the essential amino acids in plants derived by the ambient air that is captured into the plant and then becomes the basic uh, structures by which the amino acids are created? And that goes for various plants, including your uh, fungi. Well, I'll, I'll speak for fungi. And with, uh, uh, with fungi, we have to, in our substrates, provide the carbon and the nitrogen for, for the fungi to assimilate these into the products that, that we need. So we have to add, in our substrate, certain amounts of nitrogen for the fungi to convert those into the proteins that we need. And I'll let someone else speak about plants. Nitrogen fertilizer, right, right. Nitrogen fixing plants. So perhaps if we link the nitrogen fixing plants uh, to extract the nitrogen from the air and then use the waste products from those plants for the fungi to convert those nitrogen products into proteins, then that's how we would have that system. Thank you. Please hold on to those wonderful questions. I believe we will have time during the lunch. So for the sake of time in the program, uh, let's move on to our next speaker, Dr. Rod Wing from School of Plant Sciences talking about controlled environments, 10 billion people question, opportunities and challenges. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, can everybody hear me okay? And the uh, control? Okay, good. Um, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you all today. It's an exciting research retreat and I've learned uh, a tremendous amount. Um, I'm not really a greenhouse person, but I I think a lot about uh, greenhouses and how I can use them in my research. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and uh, some opportunities that I see that, that could, uh, um, we could derive together and to, uh, to uh, help solve the 10 billion people question. Okay, so this is, my, these are my, this is my outline. I have 60 slides, so I'll try to do it in about 10 minutes. So I don't really have 60 slides. Okay, so um, just a little something about myself. Um, uh, I, I direct the Arizona Genomics Institute. I've been here since 2002. Um, we're in the uh, Keating Bioresearch Building here uh, on the north of Speedway, and these are my three of my group leaders. And we do a lot of uh, uh, genome biology, genome sequencing, informatics, uh, comparative genomics. Um, our group has uh, essentially played significant contributions to over 50 genome projects uh, since we've been here, uh, including uh, uh, African and Asian rice, uh, a bunch of wild horizon species, corn, drosophila, soybean, cacao, to, just to name a few. Um, so uh, one of the, 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 the big question that, that um, I think about every day in our lab and pretty much probably all of us in this audience is really uh, um, how are we going to grow enough food to feed the world in, in less than 40 years? We're going to have three more billion people on the planet by 2050. Um, I work on rice. Um, I'm the largest rice producer in the state of Arizona. And uh, rice feeds half the world. Uh, and it's uh, the rice-dependent population that's going to double by 2050. So what the community is working on is to develop new varieties of rice that are higher yielding, but ones that have less of an, a footprint, ones that require less fertilizer, water, pesticides, and also have reduced greenhouse gas emissions. We call these the next generation super crops. Uh, uh, the Chinese would call this uh, um, green super rice. So how are we going to, how, what, what is the solution that, that I think is going to help us solve this problem? And that is, uh, the, the, the idea is to capture the natural variation that actually exists um, in, in the, the wild relatives of rice as well as cultivated species. So you can, you can find uh, genetic diversity in rice for almost any conceivable trait. Okay, this shows uh, various uh, uh, seed shapes, seed color, um, panicle architecture, and plant architecture. And uh, the 
International Rights Research Institute, where I work, uh, where, not where I work all the time, I work some of the time, uh, in the Philippines, uh, they have a, a, the, a gene bank that has 100, that where they maintain 130,000 accessions of rice. And um, uh, recently, uh, Erie, uh, in collaboration with China, um, sequenced 3,000 of these accessions, diverse accessions. These 3,000 accessions can essentially be divided into 15 subpopulations. Here are uh, indica varieties, aus varieties, uh, japonica varieties up here. And this is, this, this is, these are the, the groups. These are the uh, locations where they, they can be found. And um, now, now that we have this genetic information for these 3,000 accessions, the next step is to essentially phenotype uh, these accessions. So this is uh, Los Banos, the Philippines. And uh, this is their um, one of their one of their uh, main farms that they have there, and the idea is to essentially plan out these three thousand accessions in the field and in the greenhouse under under uh, hundreds and hundreds of different environmental conditions and growth conditions to try to associate a phenotype with a genotype and use that information to breed new varieties of rice that are are, are the green super rice varieties. So in addition to this global rice away that we want to plant in, uh, in Erie, uh, at several farms in Erie, we're also interested in, in taking this global rice array and, uh, and planting it up in Maricopa. This is the, uh, uh, the field scanalyzer that's been uh, installed there. And this is a, um, uh, a gantry system with a, uh, an, uh, a set of instruments that can go up and down the field uh, and take um, detailed measurements of the crops uh, on a daily basis, almost hourly basis. So in addition to, to um, looking at the cultivated species of rice, for uh, the cultivated rice varieties, these, these 130,000 accessions, my laboratory is also interested in the wild relatives of rice. The wild relatives contain a virtually untapped reservoir of genes that can be used for crop improvement. And uh, so the, here's an example of, of some of the wild relatives. These are the, uh, this is Asian and, and uh, African cultivated rice. And here are some of the wild relatives. One of the ones I always like to talk about is Ariza cortata. It's a um, very distant relative. Um, it is actually, it's a polyploid that can actually grow in salt water. It has the, the um, it has a range from Myanmar to Pakistan along the, uh, in brackish water. So, We've recently sequenced this genome, and we're now trying to identify the genes that are associated with uh, salt tolerance. And, and the nice thing about working within the, the wild relatives of rice is that all of these wild relatives can be crossed into cultivated rice to uh, um, essentially, uh, we, we're not really using the GMO technology. We're using conventional breeding methods to bring in this, reintroduce or introduce new genetic variation. So. Here's an example of a, of a screen that I've collaborated with, with uh, Amelia Henry as, a, as another example. And this is a, a drought tolerance uh, screen. And right here, uh, we've looked at, we looked at all, we looked at 24 species of the, of the genus Ariza uh, under various drought conditions. And we've identified a, uh, a, an, an accession, uh, a species called Ariza glumapetula. This is an a, uh, a, 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 um, close relative of cultivated rice that's found in South America. And so we are now um, screening an additional set of germplasm with 70 accessions to identify uh, glumapetula lines that, that are even more drought tolerant or less and map these genes and use this to, uh, to again, make more drought tolerant and more heat tolerant rice. Um, so uh, to understand the wild relatives of rice, uh, I. Um, initiated two programs, the International Horizon Map Alignment Project and the Horizon Genome Evolution Projects. And the, the goal here is to essentially create a, a, a genome level, a closed genomics level system to uh, understand the, the entire genus and to look at both basic and applied applications. Here is the, some, uh, some of the voucher accessions uh, in, at, at a greenhouse at Erie. Um, we've recently sequenced 13 of these genomes, and uh, we've done a, um, a tremendous amount of analysis uh, of the data. And uh, this work is now under its third revision uh, uh, at Nature. So we're close to pub publishing this data. So 
what I want to talk about is just a little bit about future directions and, and a discussion. So what are we going to do? Uh, what's the next level? So uh, what we want to do, uh, again, is take these, um, this global rice array, and we want to screen for new types of phenotypes uh, that, ha that you really can't find in the South Pacific. Um, that being uh, heat tolerant, drought tolerance, so using this uh, scanalyzer here. We've also, um, uh, are, are also growing uh, a number of varieties, uh, populations in our greenhouses on the Sixth Street Garage. And so the, the idea here is to really, we're really interested in phenotyping. So this would be kind of arming these greenhouses, these field stations with very sophisticated instruments that can be used to measure plant growth, uh, um, under various environmental conditions over a, a time course. And then you can essentially map genes over a time course and use that information to, again, uh, identify genes and traits, regions of the genome that can be used to um, um, breed new varieties of rice that are more sustainable. Um, additionally, our group is uh, involved in uh, generating high quality uh, reference genomes for all of these 15 uh, these groups, then th this can be, allow us to more precisely identify the, the variation that's associated with the, these, um, these traits that we're going to be phenotyping. And uh, lastly, we are also uh, now um, focused on sequencing the, the, all of the polyploid genomes. These are much more difficult to sequence in Arisa cortata up here. Uh, we already finished. And we have two more of the uh, polyploid genomes that we're going to to, to uh, work on for basic and applied uh, analysis. Um, so what are the future directions? Okay, One thing that uh, I'm really pushing here at UA is uh, plant breeding. I mean, we have this all this variation, but what about plant breeding? And plant breeding is very important for not only you know field crops, but it's also important to develop new varieties that can gr be grown in in controlled environments. And I don't think there's a whole lot of, there's definitely not no breeding going on at UA that, that is addressing uh, trying to breed new varieties that are going to be better in the greenhouse versus uh, in the field. So we recently hired, uh, uh, offered a, uh, well, we, we've hired a, a plant breeder, Duke Polly, and uh, he has some expertise in, in cotton. And I've, I've, we've written a grant uh, already to, uh, to try to work on rice in the, at the Maricopa Ag Center. But I think we need additional breeders at UA. So I think that's an important um, feature that we need to really emphasize. Um, we need to build greenhouse and field phenotyping capacity, um, not only in Tucson, but also in, in Yuma and in Maricopa. And uh, this last thing is something that, that uh, I, I'm very interested in, I know you all are thinking about this um, already, uh, but I think really an urban ag program at UA would be very powerful. And it should include not only SEAC, but also the you know, School of Plant Sciences, the School of Family and Consumer Sciences, and, and, and I just threw in this edible schoolyard, which is, uh, I used to, I went to Berkeley and, they, and um, uh, uh, there's a, a a famous uh, Chez Panisse, uh, Alice Waters has uh, promoted this program in Berkeley where essentially the kids essentially grow their own food and eat their own food in school, which is pretty exciting. I think that would be a, something that we could promote here at, 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 in, in Tucson. But anyway, those are, those are my uh, 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 priorities, and it's uh, really exciting to be here at, in the SEAC uh, this research retreat because I've gotten so many ideas already and I hope that uh, I can work with you all to uh, um, promote some of these ideas. And with that, this is my view of the world. Um, this is the rice world, but uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Rod. Thank you very much for sharing the information about your activities and the, uh, the envisioned direction on the last slide. We are very excited about it and looking forward to working with you and, that, and with the colleagues as well throughout the university and college. So next we have Dr. Jean Giacomelli. Jean has been on sabbatical, theoretically speaking. <laughs> oh, so we're going to hear from him uh, about what he has been up to on his sabbatical activities. Jean? Thank you. Uh, maybe I should get up front, right? 
first uh, thank um, Marant and Austin and all those who are participating to make today a success. It's very good to see. Yes, I am on sabbatical. It's only been six weeks. I'm feeling better already. But um, I did take uh, a, a visit to the Cultivate uh, trade show in Ohio, and I met a lot of interesting people who have degrees from our programs here. So I'm going to show you a few of them. Here's Joellen, just uh, a few months ago, is now working for Link4. It's a climate control company out of California. Johan Buck has been uh, uh, gone for a while, two, 2005, got his master's here, and then he went on to get his uh, PhD in Arkansas, I believe. Um, but he's um, up just um, in Phoenix, um, sales and product uh, development and crop advisor. Jacob Hodu, who came out of Ag and Biosystems Engineering 2004, is working outside of Davis, California for the Newnham's Seed Company, and he was there at the, so all of these are people that were at their booths. Wadsworth Control, Nick Earls, BS Plant Sciences 2005, and one of Pat's students, right, who he knows how to grow tomatoes, and he's now operating the greenhouses for Newnham's in developing other seeds. Kristen Hansen in 2012 is up in Washington working for Horticultural Services. I met her. Um, Kayla Birch was there, but I, I didn't get to meet her and take a picture, so this is not Kayla, but I thought it was appropriate time in my presentation to show you this picture. Uh, you see it's on Wilmot. This is a local dog that drives on the motorcycle. Anyway, but, but Kayla's working for a plastics company that makes glazings and sells and produces them and designs greenhouses. And then there is the storybook wedding, and the man is here. I, while I was out that way, I stopped in Iowa for a wedding, and Dave and Kenzie are here uh, just moments after they had their... Uh, their uh, ceremony completed, and he's now working for Hortimax, Ritter Hortimax, a climate control company that's been very supportive of the center, and we're, we're glad he is. He also has picked up some new capabilities of ballroom dancing. He did a tremendous, uh, unless you already did that, you used to do that in, in Kasira's lab, and I didn't know it. You paid your way through grad school as a dancer. Well, here he is having his first dance. Uh, then there, there are changes. Um, Ohio Gazimus means good morning, but there's the, the Kubotas that are going to Ohio State University. And um, Jerry Kubota, of course, and Mark Krogel. And we will miss them uh, severely here at the University of Arizona, and specifically the Controlled Environment Act Center. And we're going to work very hard to try to get additional people that can begin, just begin to fulfill what they have done for us. The positive side is, is that not only are our students wanted and desirable out there in the real world, but our faculty are too, and, and, and staff. And we really, really appreciate that. Um, a couple of work-related things I've been doing on my sabbatical. The Eden ISAS project is, um, this is Matt Bramsey that is helping develop. This is a modular growing system that will go to Antarctica. Uh, this is the German Space Agency that's doing this. Um, and you see the colored lights. There's food production, and then there's a laboratory. This is adjacent to the German um, um, facilities on, on the ice in Antarctica. And this is Paul Zabel that's going to have to go there and live for a year and grow these crops. Uh, he'll be leaving in, in January, uh, December, and uh, all of 2018 he'll be producing fresh veggies down at, uh, on, on the ice in Antarctica for that station of nine people. It's very similar to what we had done in 2004 and continue at the South Pole Food, Food Growth Chamber in the U.S. station. But this is now modernized. You see LED lights. You see Daniel Schubert, who's really leading the project. And he really believes in sensors for monitoring. This is their control room. Unbelievable. Um, so you see the scale. There he is. And there's just a huge number of screens. So Paul will never have 
a, a silent time where he cannot be found, uh, except for one place or two. Anyway, um, Seattle. I was up in Seattle, and um, the Chiluli um, glass uh, demonstration, beautiful facility. Why do I say that? Because this is Thousand Flower Garden here. These are, this is all glass, colored glass. And what I like about Chiluli is that he appreciates greenhouses. This is the greenhouse that was built uh, for him um, at the site at the Seattle Center. And inside of it, there you see scale with people. Again, all glass artwork. Unbelievable. And there's a whole interior section where the, the uh, thousand flowers were that um, uh, many, many um, pieces of artwork. But the greenhouse helps make it. My final segment is about the Museum of Flight, also in Seattle and dominated by uh, Boeing. But uh, they had a special exhibit on Apollo. And for those who don't remember, we did go to the moon. And hopefully we'll get back there again, this time being able to stay and feed people. This was the little compartment they had to fly in uh, to get to the moon. This was the smaller compartment that they had to go down to the moon on. And it had one engine to get them back. It had to work every time and it did 12 times and uh, sorry six times appreciate that this was a buggy that they drove in um, on time to to get around on the on the moon and this is uh i think it's my last slide this is the some of the facts and figures the commitment that was made to go to the moon and when you hear about opportunities to do another Apollo project. Be careful when you hear that because this is what it what it might cost. What I appreciate is that at the time it was approximately 4% of the annual total budget of the United States. That's a commitment. I think when we, and now we're at a half a percent and, and maybe not increasing. So maybe when the 10 billion people start complaining that they are hungry, and seriously complaining, then more funds will come to people and organizations and students that can produce the food. Let's hope that continues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gene. Um, OK, next, I think we have Dr. Roroba. I don't know. Probably on the top. Okay. That's it. Hmm? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Okay. Yes, I'm Pat Rohrbaugh. Um, I did retire last year, um, but. I wanted to give you sort of an update on what's uh, going on with a group that you might not even be aware of here at the Controlled Environment Ag Center, and that is the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center Volunteer Group. Um, how many volunteers do we actually have in the audience? Raise your hands. Okay, so you can look around, and there's, there's a few here today. All right. Um, just to give you a little history, this did not sort of just spring out of the SEAC. This was actually a program that initially started as an extension program uh, at that building right uh, north of us uh, under George Brookbank. And some of our volunteers uh, actually had been in that group initially. George retired in 1995, and the group was basically shut down as an extension program. However, we wanted to stay together. so. We did so as an outside group. Um, the, the hydroponic gardeners of Tucson, we met in restaurants, schools, and, and for a while we were over here in the head house. Uh, and then the, then the University of Arizona um, uh, decided it would be a good idea uh, with uh, uh, Merle Jensen's leadership to begin the Controlled Environment Ag Center. And Gene was brought in, and, and suddenly we had a building here and a place to meet. So um, 
So we took a vote and we became the Control Environment Ag Center volunteer group uh, in about 2002. And because I was working at that time, I became the, um, the official coordinator. <clears throat> okay, so typically, I'm going to just tell you some of the things that the volunteer group does. Uh, we typically uh, have been meeting on the second Saturday of every month uh, between September and May, and the meetings are held in this room. Uh, we have maybe a speaker, maybe we take a tour. Uh, sometimes, usually a couple times a, a year, we have a potluck. And, uh, and hopefully, sometimes, uh, if there's extra produce available, uh, then we can share some produce from our various greenhouses. Some of our Saturday um, meetings, we've included tours. And some of these have been uh, local uh, tours. So uh, Miles Lewis, who spoke earlier, has um, uh, been kind enough to give us uh, tours of his various uh, lettuce projects along the way. We even went down to the Environmental Research Lab before the aquaponics projects were moved up here, uh, they were down at, at ERL, down by the airport. And so this is, uh, this is one of our tours down at the airport. OK, um, this past year, now I did retire a year ago. So in the, in the 2016 to 17 year, um, I kind of took a, a, a step back to, to see if, if we could get um, other people to come in. Uh, but unfortunately, an extension involvement was unrealized. Um, and so the volunteers took it upon themselves on those second Saturdays of the month to actually go around to each other's houses and, and see different people's uh, setups, uh, their greenhouses. You can see that, um, and for example, here's, this, is, this is Carter, and this is his uh, greenhouse that he actually made by himself. Um, other people have had, you know, made greenhouses, uh, and sometimes they'll have outdoor systems, uh, things like that. So we, we went and we critiqued uh, everybody's uh, uh, systems, and that was a lot of fun. Um, we've also got a core group that is maintaining um, half of a greenhouse. Um, I don't think there's been a lot said about the, um, the student organization, but uh, this greenhouse that's right across the way here is half student organization, half volunteers. And what the volunteers do, this core group, is that they have set up a variety of simple systems uh, that maybe could be used by uh, students and teachers, home hobbyists, and even some of our uh, students for doing uh, independent study projects. Um, they have gone and, and visited this greenhouse to see different types of simple systems, um, bucket systems and things made out of PVC pipe, and even, even little systems made, made out of, of uh, soda bottles, OK? Uh, something that could be used uh, very simply on your back porch or in a school system, OK? So that's been a, a very important part of, of the volunteer group, that they have been able to um, maintain these different systems uh, over the years. Here is, uh, in, that, in that greenhouse, uh, here is longtime SEAC uh, volunteer, Ed Maxwell, and he's giving a, a, um, a tour to some, some folks uh, to look at tomato cutting production, for example. Um, the SEAC volunteers have also been part of uh, our various activities throughout the year. One of them that we have is our annual short course in, in the spring. And um, originally, they helped assemble notebooks. Now um, uh, Austin just sends the file off to Kinko's, and it comes back, and it's amazing. Um, volunteers have also helped at the registration desk uh, with audiovisual during the talks. I know Rafi has, has done that uh, for a number of years. Um, people coming here on our hands-on day uh, to go into our greenhouses and learn about different aspects of control environment agriculture, they are here for the first time. They might not know, just looking at a map, where do I need to go? So, so they, uh, our volunteers have been out there with little signs helping people to get to, the next, uh, to, to their next um, um, appointment on the hands-on workshop day. 
Um, then we also have salad makers. And this year, I got to actually be a volunteer salad maker. Yeehaw. Um, uh, and thank you, Jean, uh, wherever you are, for that picture. Uh, Jean took the picture as we had finished the salads. Uh, then um, for the edification of the volunteers, um, sometimes if seats are available, uh, then they can buy a ticket on the tour bus. And here are some of the volunteers at uh, Sunny Zona uh, when, we, when we went there as well. And in fact, you can see these two ladies here. They're sitting right over there. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, the SEAC volunteers have also chipped in to help with the SEAC Beautification Day, which is uh, just before the annual short course. Um, and uh, so we have, this is assisted by SEAC students, faculty, and staff. And, and we've been helping to keep the, uh, uh, the, the landscape uh, kept up. Volunteers have helped throughout the years. Um, with various projects. Here they're working uh, to seed uh, and to help maintain the plants in the teaching greenhouse, and also at the end of the season to help take out the plants. Okay. Um, also, oh, thank you very much. These are, these are wonderful pictures. Um, some of the volunteers have actually sat in on Plant Science 217. I was actually looking for this particular um, uh, picture. Thank you, Austin. That's a good one. Um, they've also gone uh, on to teach children's uh, hydroponics classes. Some have worked with the VA hospital greenhouse. Uh, if you didn't even know that there was one down there, there is. And some have worked with senior centers. So they've taken their, their information that they've learned here into the community. Okay. So this year I'm working with the uh, acting SEAC director. Um, Dr. Maraka Chira to reinstate the second Saturday of the month meetings. Uh, the SEAC volunteers would love to hear what you have been doing and what you are doing. So this is a, um, a, a cheap uh, advertisement here. We would love to have you come to our second Saturday of the month meetings uh, to make a presentation. Um, and and uh, there have been so many fantastic uh, projects going on that we've heard about today. So uh, I am, I am um, offering uh, an opportunity here for you to participate. Uh, if you want to give a talk, a tour, uh, let me know. I think Austin's going to send out a doodle poll. Um, thank you so much. And special thanks to all our volunteers for all that you do. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Pat. And thank you very much for managing and organizing, uh, working with our volunteer group, and we value interacting with them. And, and I echo you, and thank you so much. We're thankful uh, our, to our volunteer group yep. to support our outreach activities and many other events that we have here. All right, next uh, we have Dr. Rafi Gruner, Emeritus Faculty and our designated Compass colleague, and talking about Friday seminar series. So I know uh, the audience is uh, ready to eat. I'll be extremely brief. My name is Rafi Gruner, and I run the Covering Environments seminar series for SEAC. Uh, Covering Environments is uh, a name that was given to the seminar series by our fearless leader, Gene Giacomelli. And in the kind of same spirit as that, I think the seminars uh, can also have equivalent nomenclature, which I like, which is interdisciplinary stimulation and cross-fertilization. And from now on, that's what we're going to call the seminar series. Uh, the seminar series that uh, I've been organizing has been running for two years now, Friday afternoons, uh, the last Friday pretty much of uh, each month during the academic year. And uh, my sense is that the seminar series not only provides intellectual stimulation to the students especially, uh, to the faculty and staff of SEAC, but also eventually filters 
into or percolates into uh, activities which I would like to claim credit for that otherwise may not have happened. Uh, the fact that Rod Wing is sitting here uh, is one example. Joel Coelho is another example. Um, Barry Pryor, yet another example. And finally, another example is Andrew Weil, and you've seen his name uh, posted on some of the previous presentations. Uh, this coming year, we're going to have, again, a series of speakers, some from the inside, some from the outside, and you can see them listed here. The first is going to be Joaquin Ruiz, who is uh, kind of a super dean at the uh, university. He's in charge of the Colleges of Arts and Letters and Science. Uh, he will be talking first, and he'll be talking about a number of initiatives that uh, bridge between CALS, College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, and the College of Science. Uh, but most uh, prominently, he is going to be talking about joint projects with SEAC uh, and Biosphere 2. Uh, then we're going to have uh, Martha Hawes, who is going to be talking about um, what roots do other than just suck up water and nutrients for plants. Uh, very exciting new findings uh, which have just, just been published. So it's very exciting about that. Uh, Gogi Davidovich is going to be talking next about plant-insect interactions. And finally, uh, Gary Nabhan is going to be talking about comparisons and, and uh, uh, contrasts between field and uh, uh, controlled environment agriculture. So I'm very happy to continue to do this. As you can see, the uh, series for the fall semester is filled up. And again, I'm going to call on each and every one of you, if you're interested in participating in this series, please uh, let me know and I'll put you on the list. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rafi. And uh, I don't know how much we can thank you uh, for your help uh, managing the Covering Environments series and uh, for others. Thank you. I just very, very quickly, because I don't want to stand between you and lunch, is I wanted to thank you all for coming. I find, um, I believe, here I'll step forward so you don't have to twist around. Um, I'm convinced that controlled environment agriculture is an essential tool for meeting the nutritional needs of our nation and our world and beyond. Um, and I'm very proud to be a part of uh, this fine community of scientists and engineers and uh, business people and uh, volunteers. And I'm just very grateful that you took your time out today to find out what we're doing here at the Controlled Environment Agriculture. And as you can see, we're a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, collaborative group. And um, I'm glad that you've joined us. Thank you, and get to lunch. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, again. So let's enjoy the lunch. And before that, let's take our group.